sorry, you all have to write. <laughs> Let's get this thing open. Your Majesty, dear Excellencies, dear Delegates. A warm welcome to this conference here in Stockholm and to all of you who's participating online. It's the conference on prevention models to address the demand that fosters traffic, trafficking for sexual purposes. That's an issue that is perhaps more relevant than ever. Trafficking is a severe form of gender-based violence. And the Russian aggression has again showed how war and conflict increase exploitation and trafficking in human beings. Sweden has since the outbreak of the war highlighted the need to include an anti-trafficking perspective in the humanitarian response. And furthermore, we have underlined the need to address the demand that fosters trafficking in human beings. We can never accept that women, girls and boys fleeing war end up in exploitation and abuse. That is why we and our Minister of Justice have uh, arranged this conference. And this is also to underscore the joint obligation to target the demand to ensure that we prevent further exploitation in prostitution and trafficking in human beings. And during this course of these two days, we will hear from different experts. It's from international organizations, governments and civil society, as well of survivors of exploitation. And they will talk about the current situation and the needs ahead concerning prevention efforts and how to address the demand. And I'm looking forward to hear from all of you and that we should have a fruitful and intense discussion on this issue. And I strongly encourage all of you to discuss with each other or in here in this room, but also outside when we have a coffee break or when we have a dinner as well. And now I would like to start by giving the floor to Her Majesty Queen Sylvia for a keynote speech to start this conference. And on behalf of all of us here today, I want to thank Your Majesty for the long-term and sincere commitment to these issues. So welcome, Your Majesty, to the stage. Thank you. Ministers, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We gather here today with a shared ambition to address the demand that forces trafficking for sexual purposes. Trafficking in human beings is a despicable crime that violates the human rights of its many victims. The vast majority of victims of trafficking 
are women, exploited for sexual purposes. And as many as one out of three identified victims of trafficking are children. This is unacceptable. All children have a right to be safe and have a childhood free from violence and exploitation. Preventing violence and sexual abuse of children has been close to my heart for many years. More than 20 years ago, I founded World Childhood Foundation and the inspiration came from children I met. I saw their suffering and vulnerability, but also their resilience and strength. I hoped that I could use my voice to shine a light on the global problem of child sexual abuse and exploitation. To speak about the unspeakable and to give children back their right to a childhood. But I did not start a foundation with the intention to only speak. I did it because I wanted to enable concrete action for children most at risk. And because I firmly believe that we need to start early. We need to address the vulnerabilities and risks that make up the root causes of exploitation. And because I believe in partnership. Together, in partnership, we can shine a light on the problem. Because despite the severity of the crime and the scale of the problem, we must not despair. A lot of things are actually getting better. Child sexual abuse and exploitation is now spoken about. Slowly but surely, responsibility and shame is put where it belongs, with the perpetrators. Survivors are speaking up, holding us all accountable. We also see international collaboration on a different scale than 20 years ago. The private sector is joining in, together with public and civil society. But the times we live in also presents new challenges. The speed of technological advancement we experience today is sometimes overwhelming. We must, however, not only see the risks. Technology also offers the potential to, de to deliver solutions that protect and empower children. Ladies and gentlemen, effective legislation is a cornerstone for sustainable change of norms and behaviors in society. And I'm proud that Sweden has adopted pioneering legislation, which demonstrate that we are constantly pushing the norms and challenge behaviors that previously was accepted. Russia's aggression against Ukraine has forced millions to flee for their lives. Ruthless traffickers are taking advantage of the situation, and refugees are being forced into prostitution and other forms of sexual exploitation. The situ situation for these victims is of utmost urgency, and the war in Ukraine is only one of many crises driving people into the hands of traffickers. Wherever there is poverty, unrest, and inequality, there is a risk for exploitation. Even here in Sweden, there are victims of trafficking. The aim of this conference is to discuss different means to target the demand that forces trafficking for sexual purposes. I welcome this focus, 
which is key to ensure a zero vision for trafficking in human beings. As long as people are willing to pay for sexual services, the trafficking will continue. We will hear from different countries and different professions. We will listen to policymakers and practitioners discussing the road forward to get to the bottom of this problem. We will also listen to survivors of trafficking. Their experiences must always be at the center of the discussion. Not only will they remind us that behind each number in the statistics there is an individual girl or boy, woman or man, each with their own personal story. Each survivor brings experiences we need to learn from. We all need to do more together to address trafficking and therefore I'm especially happy for the gathering here today. This shows our joint commitment. I know sexual abuse and exploitation is not an easy topic to speak about. But we, if we don't speak up, who will? I, sorry. I ask you today to use your voices. Let children who have suffered sexual exploitation and victims of trafficking understand that we believe them, that they are not alone, that we will protect them and not the perpetrators. But even more importantly, we need to act in partnership. So let us go to work. Thank you. A great thank you, Your Majesty. I am Charlotte Eklund-Rimsten, and I'm Deputy Director of the Ministry of Justice, Division for Criminal Law. And I would like to invite our high-level panel onto stage. First, we have Gunnar Strömer, Minister for Justice of Sweden. Welcome up. And as he is getting his microphone, we are welcoming Pilar Lopcuenza, Minister of Justice from Spain. Welcome up. <clears throat> Welcome also to Pramila Patton, UN Under Secretary General against Sexual Violence in Conflict. A warm welcome. And participating online, I hope we have Olga Stefanishina, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine. No, instead we have Ilva Johansson, EU Commissioner, welcome. So we will see if we will be joined by Olga Stefanishina from Ukraine, but in the meantime, a key message of Her Majesty and also of this conference is the joint obligation to address the demand that fosters trafficking for sexual purposes. An obligation that the Russian aggression against Ukraine clearly has reminded us of and that we will get back to in detail in the panels ahead. We have a highly distinguished panel here today and you all have unique insights and yield significant influence on policies and practices that impact the work against trafficking in human beings for sexual purposes. From your different perspectives, you can also offer a unique insight to the current state of play. 
What does the trafficking situation in the world look like today? And how is it impacted by armed conflict and inequality? And I would like to begin by turning to Gunnar Strömmer in his role as Minister for Justice of Sweden and host of this conference. Sweden was the first country in the world to adopt legislation that criminalizes the purchase, but not the sale, of sexual services back in 1999. Can you tell us, Gunnar, about the challenges that you see in this area and a bit about the Swedish experiences of working against the demand that fosters trafficking for sexual purposes? Please, Gunnar. Thank, thank you. I will do my best in order to achieve that. Your Majesty, Your Excellencies, um, distinguished guests, I am of course very proud um, to um, host this important conference on, on prevention models to address the demand that fosters trafficking for sexual purposes. Uh, may I just first, I would say outside my talking points, turn to Her Majesty the Queen and applaud uh, Your Majesty's long-term commitment uh, to these issues. Your Majesty, I thought about that now, um, uh, when Her Majesty held her speech, that, uh, that Her Majesty highlighted these issues long before they were in the center of the public debate or the political debate. Uh, and for that, Your Majesty deserves our full respect and gratitude. Uh, so thank you for all your efforts uh, for a very long time and also for being here today together with us. And thank you all for joining uh, the Swedish presidency to address this uh, critical issue. And my hope is, of course, that the 24 hours uh, laying ahead of us will have a positive impact uh, on the future of tackling uh, trafficking in human beings. Uh, Sweden has assumed the presidency uh, of the EU at the time of historic challenges. Uh, and even more important, of course, than to remind ourselves of the strength that comes from our common values, like democracy, the rule of law, and respect for fundamental rights. One overarching priority for the Swedish presidency is security. And let me then start by underlining uh, our common obligation to ensure continued uh, co collective response towards Russia's illegal aggression against Ukraine and a continued support to the Ukrainian people. We also know from experience that armed conflict and unrest fosters uh, problems of other kinds, forces people to flee, which in turn put them at risk for exploitation. Sadly, the war in Ukraine is no exemption from the rule. It adds to an already critical situation in the world. Far too many people are being sexually exploited as victims of trafficking. The vast majority is women exploited in prostitution, and each year trafficking in human beings generates billions of dollars in illegal profits to organized crime. Now, trafficking exists because there are people prepared to exploit the bodies of others, mainly the bodies of women, but not exclusively. We also see an increase of exploitation of children, and then both girls and boys. Without the demand, there would be no point for traffickers to continue their operations. And therefore, since more than 20 years, Swedish law criminalizes the purchase, but not the sale, of sexual services. In our legislation, buying sex is an act of sexual violence. The support of this legal approach and the strategy to target demand reaches across the political aisle. This form of exploitation is com complex and needs to be addressed uh, on many levels simultaneously. Not the least, uh, digitization brings new major challenges. 
Today, anyone can order whatever he or she wants using various digital platforms. Basically, all forms of sexual exploitation have gone online. The Swedish experience is that our legislation has contributed to a change of norms in society and to reduce demand. The ban on the purchase of sexual services is further an important tool for law enforcement to work against trafficking in a more broader sense. However, criminal law is of course not enough. Demand must be addressed on multiple levels and it must be paired with support to those in prostitution and other forms of sexual exploitation. With us today, we have um, represent representatives from governments, international organizations, law enforcement and civil society. Uh, and I would especially like to welcome the survivors of prostitution and trafficking that take part in this conference. Your experiences and your input is invaluable for our discussion. We're certainly talking about uh, Structural, structural problem and, and organized crime, but there is always an individual victim that must be seen and listened to. In this panel, I look forward to hearing from my Spanish colleague uh, on the developments in Spain. Pilar, I know uh, of your long life commitment to these issues, first as a judge and now uh, as minister. And I know for sure that trafficking will also be a key priority uh, for the incoming Swedish, no, where the outgoing uh, presidency, the incoming, uh, the ingoing Spanish presidency. I'm very happy that we were close on this issue and so many others. Uh, the interventions from the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, if she will turn up as well as the EU Commissioner and UN Special Representative of Sexual Violence and Conflict will showcase the importance to act to prevent exploitation and to assist and protect victims of abuse. This conference uh, is an opportunity to learn from each other, to share our different experiences and to spread best practices to break the cycle of violence and exploitation and as I said at the beginning, we meet at a time of historic challenges, but also at a time with a very strong mobilization behind the values of democracy, rule of law, and the fundamental rights for every individual. So once more, you're all very welcome to, to Sweden, and I wish us all successful deliberations during this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Strömmer. And thank you especially for highlighting our Swedish experiences and the challenges ahead. Turning to Minister Lopquenza, could you give us an insight in the current situation in Spain regarding trafficking in human beings for sexual purposes and your views on the current situation concerning the escalation of armed conflict in the world? And give us some input on how you work against the demand that fosters trafficking for sexual purposes. We further know that Spain has taken steps to adopt legislation to, in some way, ban the purchase of sexual services. And if you would be so kind to share with us some motives behind the efforts to make these legislative amendments, uh, and tell us a bit about where you are in the process uh, and how the roadmap ahead looks. So, if you will, Minister Lopquenza. Well, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, Your Majesty, Majestad. Uh, permítame que me dirija en español a usted, que sé que es una gran conocedora de nuestra lengua española. Muchas gracias por venir aquí. Thank you very much also for your commitment. Um, uh, Ministry of Justice, Stromer, <laughs> thank you very much for organizing this very important 
Congress uh, during this conference, uh, during this very important also moment in our uh, political lives and our political commitments also with this issue. Thank you, uh, Under Secretary General uh, Mrs. Patton. Thank you, uh, REST Minister of Equality Issues, uh, Ambassadors, uh, Excellencies, uh, and rest of organizations that are joining us in this very important meeting. Um, this is really an honor to, to share this panel uh, with you, uh, with all of you. Uh, going to your question, for some years, Spain has been one of the main destination countries, unfortunately, for victims of trafficking in human beings, mainly for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Uh, I'm going to give some data. According to data for, uh, from Ministry of Interior, of the total number of victims of trafficking identified in Spain, 61% are trafficked for the purpose of sexual exploitation, of which 93% are women and uh, girls. The victims are also increasingly uh, young women, 70% are under 33 years old, which is something very... Um, well, concern. It is clear that, uh, that we are facing a form of crime that directly affects women, uh, means that we are uh, facing a, a serious form of gender-based violence crime. We are aware that uh, there is a large hidden number of victims of uh, these crimes, uh, trafficking for sexual exploitation and sexual exploitation without trafficking. And this is because uh, this is real, uh, really difficult to identify victims of, the, of these crimes, as everybody knows. Uh, we wanted to address it directly in a draft law, uh, law a comprehensive law against trafficking and exploitation of human beings promoted by the government of Spain, and which uh, will soon go to the parliament uh, as soon as possible, I hope. We are confident that based on this comprehensive law aimed primarily uh, at the care and protection of victims, it will be easier to detect and to help uh, all victims of trafficking, of all forms of trafficking, but of course uh, trafficking uh, with sexual purposes. Many factors contribute to increase of trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation uh, from the perspective, from the point of view of the demand of traffickers and from the point of view of the offer. This is our experience in Spain and I think it's something common in all our countries. Um, uh, from the view of uh, the demand, uh, which is uh, where the countries are receivers of uh, trafficking, we should, as a matter of fact, uh, work much more. One of the factors that contributes most to increase of this crime is linked with organized crime, which is something we are facing in many countries in, in Europe, and with the pimp industry. In recent times, unfortunately, trafficking and sexual exploitation have become one of the most lucrative criminal activities in Spain, after uh, the trafficking of weapons and trafficking of drugs. And from the point of view of the offer of, uh, of the victims, uh, contributing factors are well known, and uh, I dare to summarize them in three. The global inequality between men and women, uh, the growing economic gap between rich and poor, and situation of particular vulnera vulnerability arising from war conflicts, uh, totalitarian regimes or natural disasters, as uh, Minister, Minister uh, of Ukraine, she, she knows, and of course also the Commissioner uh, of Interior, which I don't see now, uh, but I think she is joining us uh, throughout. Oh, okay. A clear example of these situations of special vulner vulnerabilities in the millions of people displaced during the war of aggression that Russia is waging against Ukraine and the increase in armed conflicts in the world and in particular this war of aggression on our own continent in Europe, so very close to our cities, to our countries, in turn leads to an increase in trafficking and exploitation of people, especially women and children. 
The, we were in London last Monday, uh, the minister and me, myself. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, announced this at the Conference of Ministers that took held in, in London on the 20th of this month uh, to just, and to justify, uh, justify the arrest warrant issued again Vladimir Putin. Mr. Khan referred to the uh, 16,000 children um, Ukrainian children deported to Russian families. I believe that this should confirm us in the idea of including illegal adoption um, among the possible purposes of trafficking too. We, we have to, to think about uh, this and this is also suggested in the European uh, Commission, uh, by the European Commission and now under discussion in the Council's working party in cooperation in criminal matters responsible for the revision of the 2011 uh, Directive on Human Trafficking. Combating International Crimes Committed in Ukraine and combating trafficking in human beings resulting from this context of war and uh, armed conflicts must be a priority in Europe, in our countries, committed to respect for human rights. And uh, for, so, uh, in Spain, uh, we not only support this, all these measures aimed at ending the war in Ukraine and bringing those responsible to, to justice, we have also been working to prevent trafficking in human beings in accordance with the recommendations of uh, Greta of, uh, uh, at level of uh, Council of Europe by giving full protections to displaced Ukrainians, especially minors, children. In a royal decree of March uh, 2022, with urgent measures in, in response to the war in Ukraine, the government, uh, the Spanish government, approved a special system for the accreditation of victims of trafficking to uh, facilitate their access to certain services and resources, public services. And uh, thinking also of the war in Ukraine, we have implemented a reform in our criminal code last year. Um, to increase the penalty for the crime of trafficking uh, in cases where the vulnerable situation of the victim has been caused uh, or aggravated by displacement resulting, for, uh, resulting for, from an armed conflict or humanitarian catastrophes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Minister. And thank you for the very striking numbers on trafficking. That is truly despicable. And we do have Olga Stefanishina with us now online. So uh, we are very happy to, to welcome you here uh, to this conference. Um, and as we have brushed upon already, Russia's illegal aggression against Ukraine has led to a humanitarian catastrophe right here in the middle of Europe. Millions of people are seeking refuge from the war, which puts women and children at risk of being sexually exploited by traffickers. So, Minister Stefanishina, would you like to describe the challenges of your country for, and for the refugees from Ukraine in the European Union and the neighboring countries when it comes to the situation for vulnerable, vulnerable groups in terms of risk of trafficking and what support is needed from other countries? Please, Olga Stefanishina, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine. Well, thank you so much. Uh, greetings to the distinguished audience, uh, ministers, commissioner, and um, as, uh, general secretary, special rep uh, Pramila. Good to see. We just have seen each other and been permanently in a, in a contact. I want just probably to start um, with uh, a couple of major points. First and foremost, uh, when we're talking about the crises we're tackling now, the war in Ukraine, uh, we should not uh, use the terminology which uh, misleads us. First and foremost, it is the Russian Federation who started the war of aggression, uh, caused multiple atrocities and commitment of a multiple of dozens of various 
war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the Russian Federation, who is now continuing this aggression and thus causes multiple, uh, multiple uh, crises. We are one of them we are discussing right now. I think that we should be clear that uh, uh, it is happening not because of the war in Ukraine, because the Russian Federation has started the military aggression uh, in, 10 years ago and it's full scale since 24th of February. So let's not forget about that and let's be clear and precise in that regard. Second very important uh, point I want to, uh, to, to mention is that 6.5 million of Ukrainians have found shelter in uh, various countries across the globe, escape, escaping uh, massive uh, aggression of the Russian Federation, which started uh, exactly 399 days ago by shelling uh, cities, civilian residential buildings, massive tortures and sexual assault against people and civilian population uh, in the territories occupied by the Russian Federation. So, uh, so we are grateful to each and every country and partner who uh, who hosted our people, who helped them. And uh, uh, it is especially warm to me to have this note from the Spanish Minister of Justice that you have even led to amendments of some legislation which allowed to tackle in a more precise manner all the all the challenges every country faces uh, with this outraging award. Uh, but uh, in, in that regard, there's one thing also I should mention as very important. Um, uh, at the level of the democratic state, as part of the Council of Europe and as part of our permanent engagement with the European Union, uh, our, we uh, and, the, and the partners have managed to build a very strong strong, solid network of regulation, uh, regulations and institutions, which ensure uh, taking joint efforts to tackle this, uh, this uh, crimes, uh, crimes uh, type of organized crime as uh, human, trafficking in human beings and other subordinate crimes. It's also very important that uh, these kind of crimes very often they have a, a clear transborder effect. So uh, by the moment, the full-scale war started. Ukraine has already been party. Uh, together with the uh, EU member states and other countries of the Council of Europe of the major international conventions uh, in that regard. And uh, we had a very serious level of inter-engagement with Interpol, with Europol, Eurojust and other institutions. Both, uh, we also had uh, a, a developed network of bilateral agreements at the level of the law enforcement institutions, which means that we, uh, together with our European partners, since day one were capable to uh, not only identify but also tackle together with available instruments the challenges arising from the massive displacement of people escaping from the war and atrocities of the war. Uh, I see Ilva Johansson here. Uh, we have from the day one established a, a permanent coordination mechanism on all issues arising from uh, from. Uh, uh, the massive displacement of Ukrainian people, in particularly all over the territory of Ukraine. Uh, also, um, uh, uh, the special network of uh, uh, European partners called European Information Exchange Platform was uh, was created, and I think this all of these efforts has uh, led us to the understanding that uh, human trafficking when it comes to the massive displacement of Ukrainian people abroad does not have a massive effect per se. In fact, it's only 100 criminal proceedings uh, related to human trafficking which has been launched in Ukraine. And among them, following the investigation, only seven, uh, 47 um, uh, uh, citizens uh, received the statues of the victims uh, of the human trafficking, uh, with 19 women, 25 men, three children, including two boys and one girl. And most of these crimes definitely had a transborder effect, and uh, um, some of the criminal groups, uh, organized crime groups, used the, the early stages of war to, let's say, develop the network of human trafficking through uh, attempts to use uh, Ukrainian people escaping from the war, uh, vulnerable people who needed support, who needed a helping hand, just, uh, let's say, um, uh, trying to outreach them right after border, crossing the border and um, use their 
for the purposes uh, affiliated to the human trafficking. Immediately after that, uh, with European Union, we have uh, and UN institutions, we started the information campaign and tackled this event just after the border crossing um, of Ukrainian people and, and vice versa. So I think that uh, summing up all of this, uh, all of these elements, it's very important to uh, mention that our unity, not only uh, in uh, standing for democratic values, in victory of Ukraine and fighting together, is also transposed in a very in uh, in joint efforts on tackling massive events, massive challenges arising from the Russian uh, aggression in Ukraine since 2014, and especially since. 24th of February 2002. Uh, um, our network, our institutions, our uh, international legal base uh, serves as a solid basis for tackling this uh, massive uh, element of the organized crime, uh, but also making sure that the most vulnerable group of groups of people like Ukrainians who are escaping from the atrocities of war are not subjected to other types of crimes on the territory of the other state, but also within the territory of Ukraine. So I'm grateful to our partners. I can confirm and assure you that our institutions remain operational, uh, operational. our commitment remains strong, and we see that you stand with us. Uh, and I think uh, this is something which is really important opposite to other challenges that we still have to face, like forceful deportation of Ukrainian uh, children and people and families. Um, uh, Madam Minister mentioned a number of 16,000. Uh, it's only the numbers where, which we could officially confirm and identify. These are the children from orphanages, from uh, specific uh, schools where we have the registers and the data. But this number is, we have, um, let's say, information and have the leverage to say that the number of these children is much bigger, as well as the number of Ukrainians. So it's extremely important now at least to ensure the access to these people from various international monitors forcing Russia to provide information on the placement and the conditions of these people, but moreover, moreover, to unite our efforts to enforce the ruling of the International Court of Justice issued the arrest warrant for those responsible for these crimes, which are the President Putin and his uh, affiliates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Stefanishina, for highlighting the situation in Ukraine and also underlining the importance of cooperation on an international level. Under Secretary General Patton, you are firmly engaged in the work against sexual violence and conflict in Ukraine, and you have also been closely involved in the new action plan on women, peace and security in Ukraine. We would be very interested to hear your assessment on the current situation in the country. The war in Ukraine is far from the only situation in the world, putting women and children at risk of sexual exploitation and trafficking in human beings. Could you walk us through uh, main areas of concern right now and how can we strengthen the link uh, and link the work against sexual violence in conflict and prevention of trafficking in human beings and from your point of view what needs to be done in order to create a safe environment for vulnerable groups please Pramila Patton well Thank you for this uh, multi-layered uh, question. Your Majesty, distinguished uh, ministers, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by commending uh, the Swedish government and the Minister for Justice for shining the spotlight on this invisible, invisible crime. And I think that is the step number one uh, that, that, is, that is critical because we are talking about a very sophisticated, organized, high-profit, low-risk, 
but very, very invisible crime. So shining the spotlight, uh, I think you are, you are sending a very strong message to uh, predators and traffickers for whom uh, this brutal war in Ukraine is not a tragedy, but an opportunity that they are being, being watched. Uh, and you are also sending uh, a strong message to, to potential victims that they are not alone and that uh, we will not allow this heinous crime called trafficking in human beings, especially for the purpose of sexual exploitation, to fall beneath our, our, our radar. Uh, I was indeed in, uh, uh, in Ukraine last year in, in May. In fact, three days after the brutal war started, the first reports of sexual violence surfaced. And uh, it is very commendable that the Prime Minister of Ukraine and the Minister of Foreign Affairs did not do what usually uh, happens in most of the countries that fall within the purview of my, of my mandate, nearly to, uh, namely to brush it under, under the carpet. They came up and talked about it openly. And on the fourth day, on the 28th, I issued a first statement calling on the aggressors to exercise restraint when it comes to sexual violence. Then we all followed the news and, and we saw the unprecedented uh, displacement of, of, of millions of, of women and children with only uh, a small a handbag that they could carry with the elderly flee, fleeing the, the country. And we saw again how men uh, wages war and, and how women and children uh, bear the, the brunt. So I reached out to the government of Ukraine and, and, and the government was extremely receptive. And I started engaging with Deputy Prime Minister Olga Stefanishina and we identified uh, uh, the areas uh, where the government of Ukraine would actually need the support of the UN. And I went to Kyiv on the 3rd of May to sign a framework of cooperation with uh, justice and accountability, holistic service provision for survivors, uh, security sector reform uh, amongst the uh, areas of priorities, but a standalone priority area being trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation in Ukraine, but also in, in refugee receiving countries. Uh, the discussion that I had with the government of Ukraine from the outset uh, revealed their, their utmost concern about the display, the, 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 the refugee uh, uh, crisis and, and, and the concern that this humanitarian crisis could, uh, a byproduct of this humanitarian crisis could well be uh, a human trafficking crisis given the significant numbers. We're talking about millions internally displaced and, and, uh, and, and millions uh, fleeing the country and uh, close to, uh, to 18 million people inside Ukraine uh, requiring humanitarian assistance and therefore extremely, extremely vulnerable. I met with survivors of sexual violence, frontline service providers, as well as women's rights organizations who all were unanimous in, in, uh, in, in raising uh, that, that huge risk. So uh, I went back, in, uh, went back to, to Ukraine on the 3rd of March uh, for a United for Justice conference, which was organized by the Office of the Prosecutor General. And again, it's extremely commendable that in the midst of a brutal war, the government of Ukraine wanted to send a very st strong signal that they would not tolerate uh, uh, this culture of impunity. And there was a dedicated panel on sexual violence, including trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. Uh, uh, and uh, it was really an expert group meeting dedicated to, to, to reversing, uh, reversing that culture of impunity. And we discussed, um, uh, we focus on justice and accountability and, and legislative reform. Concretely, uh, following the, the signing of the implement of the framework of cooperation, my office uh, has worked uh, 
within an intergovernmental task force led by Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Stefani Shina, with five sub-working groups, one dedicated to trafficking, and we launched the implementation plan during the UN General Assembly. The work has started. We have, my office has started to train, uh, to work very closely with the Office of the Prosecutor General and the specialized unit on, on conflict-related sexual violence cases. We are doing training. We are doing awareness raising. We are working on legislative uh, uh, reform. Uh, the government of Ukraine is extremely mindful that it needs a robust legislative framework. In terms of how do we strengthen and link the work against sexual violence and prevention of trafficking, the normative framework regarding the, this link between sexual violence in conflict and trafficking is robust and exist since 2016 with the adoption of Security Council Resolution 2331, which for the first time articulated that nexus, urging states to take uh, appropriate measures within their national legal system to both investigate and, and prosecute the crimes that actually recognize the extreme trauma experienced by victims of trafficking that highlights the importance of assistance and services and also call for decisive and immediate action to prevent, criminalize, investigate, prosecute, and ensure accountability of those who engage in, in trafficking. But the challenge, of course, is how to close the gap between those commitments and compliance, how to convert those resolutions into solutions on the ground. And, uh, uh, and indeed, I mean, like, our response to trafficking arising out of this brutal war in Ukraine may well be the, 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 the litmus test, and we, we really cannot afford to, to fail. And uh, again, I, I keep saying that we cannot allow this humanitarian crisis to turn into human trafficking crisis. We will be judged by history in, 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 in years to come. And I just want to say that the scarcity of data should in no way be taken to indicate a lack of criminal activity. Uh, especially for human trafficking, which often deprives its victims of voice and agency and reduces capacity for detection. And uh, so first, and first of all, we should not lose sight of the crime itself uh, because too often it goes undetected and undeterred. And to a chilling effect, trafficking in person for sexual exploitation remains uh, an underground crime against a perceived underclass of victims. And, and, and to address the issue, uh, to address it, we, the issue must remain visible or at all times and on the radar of law enforcement officials. And I just want to leave you with uh, three critical uh, lenses. The first is a gender lens. Because even if we dismantle the criminal networks and brothels, deter demand and arrest the perpetrators, unless there are educational opportunities and viable economic alternatives, women and girls will always be at a heightened risk. Uh, the one constraint in human tra constant in human trafficking is poverty, and poverty has a female face. And we will never break the vicious cycle of gender-based violence and exploitation without prioritizing the economic empowerment of, uh, uh, of women. The second consideration is that we cannot be conflict blind. From Ukraine to Myanmar and elsewhere, we see that women and girls comprise the vast majority of civilians forcibly displaced by war, who flee with nothing more than the clothes on their backs and the belongings they can carry by hand. Women's physical security and their economic security are indivisibly linked with conflict dynamics compounding economic desperation. I mean, again, we have seen this. I have seen how nearly half of all victims of trafficking in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh, since 2017 are Rohingya refugees driven from Myanmar by, by military attacks and left without economic or social safety nets. Minister, I want to really commend you in the organization of this conference and for inviting survivors and giving them a, a voice because the third lens I want to talk about is that of the survivor. Survivor engagement is essential as they know firsthand the tactics 
that traffickers use, including online. They know the obstacles that they face and what works to support socioeconomic reintegration. Thank you. Thank you, Under Secretary General Patton, for the important message about sexual violence and conflict, the experiences from the Ukraine, and the link between sexual violence and conflict and trafficking in human beings. Turning to Commissioner Johansson, who is with us here on display now. The European Union has played a crucial role in supporting Ukraine in this crisis. And EU, EU countries are welcoming refugees and EU authorities are working to lessen the risks of exploitation for those fleeing from Ukraine. Would you kindly describe how this has been coordinated by the European Union and what you see as the main challenges ahead? Furthermore, the EU Directive Against Trafficking in Human Beings is currently being partially revised. The proposed amendments presented by the Commission has a stronger focus on the Member States' obligation to address the demand. Could you guide us through the proposed changes and the expected results of these amendments? <laughs> Small question. Uh, Ilva Johansson, EU Commissioner, please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll try to answer your questions. Uh, and um, uh, first, uh, let me say good afternoon to everybody. And I would like to start by thanking uh, the Swedish presidency and uh, also uh, Her Majesty the Queen Sylvia, Queen Sylvia in particular, uh, and everybody here for all your commitment to fight trafficking of human beings. It's an organized crime, as been described here earlier. It's a dis despicable crime is a misgenious crime, is a crime carried out mainly by men, mainly against women, mainly for sexual exploitation. It is a crime that treats women as a commodity to be bought and sold. I think of the 18 women rescued by Spanish police, Spanish police is doing a lot, we heard that already, they were tattooed by the traffickers, tattooed, to show who they belong to, to show that they are property. While a criminal can sell drugs or a gun only once, he can sell a woman's body again and again and again and again. Traffickers prey on the vul vulnerable and few people are more vulnerable than women and girls in times of conflict. Like, for example, the two girls aged 10 and 13 from Sweden, taken by their mother and a man to join Daesh, where one of the girls were forced into marriage and raped. War breeds trafficking. This we know. So on the 24th of February, the day Russia invaded Ukraine, it was immediately clear millions of people will flee. Millions of women and children will be in danger from traffickers. We immediately call an extraordinary council for ministers of interior. And when the, and when the council ended on the Sunday afternoon, I went directly to the airport and went to the EU borders right away. To Romania, Slovakia, to Poland. I saw all these women and children tired and afraid, freezing. I saw the immense solidarity, people offering a place in their car, a place in their home, a place in their heart. It was really heartwarming to see all the solidarity. Of course, I also thought, what if just one is dishonest? What if just, just one car doesn't bring a journey to safety, but to suffering? I know we had to do two things, welcome the refugees and protect them from traffickers. So uh, six days after the, uh, inv the full-scale invasion started, I proposed to activate the temporary protection directive. One week after the invasion started, the member states agreed unanimously on my proposal. 
And that gave millions of Ukrainian refugees immediate right to protection, right to housing, to health care, to education, and a right to work. This made Ukrainian refugees much less vulnerable, much less likely to fall prey to of traffickers. And I put also the fight against trafficking on top of the EU agenda. I raised it with Parliament and Member States. The anti-trafficking coordinator, Diane Smith, jumped into action and activated all her networks. Europol set up a special task force immediately, and we launched a common anti-trafficking action plan to warn women and children of the dangers, to support and protect victims, to improve police response. And I'm very happy to listen to Olga Stefanishnia here. Olga, I don't know whether you're still online, but as you also already mentioned, from the very first day, we had a very good cooperation, you and I, and the Ukrainian government, Ukrainian authorities, and you've been working very closely uh, together on this. Ukrainian and EU police forces are carrying out anti-trafficking operations together under MPACT, the EU platform against criminal threat. And this year, Ukrainian police will take part in 17 joint operations. I think that we can see now that our early united and comprehensive action is paying off. The total number of confirmed cases of trafficking since the start of the war is quite low. As Olga already explained from Ukraine, but we see the same in the European Union, very few cases taking into account the millions of people that have arrived. So it seems like we have been quite successful in preventing, but of course we need to stay vigilant because this is, uh, this is not over yet. I think that we can build in our fight on my EU strategy against trafficking that I launched two years ago. The fight against trafficking in human beings has been my priority long before Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And I have to remind you, this is a crime committed in the European Union by Europeans against Europeans more of half of all the victims of trafficking, in Europe, of, of trafficking in human beings in EU are EU citizens. Of the trafficked children in the European Union, more than 80% are EU citizens, exploited mainly in their own country. 70% of the prosecuted perpetrators are EU citizens. I want to end the impunity for perpetrators who far too often get away with their crimes. I would like to take the criminal money away from them, the money they make out of their victims' suffering, estimated to be 14 billion euro every year for this heinous crime of trafficking. I have proposed a new legislation to freeze and seize criminal assets. I presented it last year. Trafficking will not end as long as men are willing to pay for using a woman's body, forced into sexual exploitation. And this is unfortunately not a crime in all member states. I think it's time to say, enough. We won't tolerate this crime anywhere in our European Union. In my new legislation, the revised directive to fight tra trafficking in human beings, that's, uh, that I proposed, proposed December last year, that uh, would make all knowing exploitation of victims to be a crime in all member states. I would like to thank again the Swedish presidency for making this a big priority, and I know that the European Parliament made the same priority. I hope that we will reach an agreement for the whole proposal at the end of this year, during the Spanish presidency. And finally, and most important, what has been highlighted by all of the speakers so far, are the victims, the survivors. I want us to say to these women and to the children, it's not your fault. And you are not alone. As European Union, we will do what we can to free you, to help you, to protect you, and to prosecute your perpetrators. And let us all today make a promise to these women and say, 
You can count on us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Johansson. And I would like to thank all of the distinguished members of this first panel. There is so much to take with us from your interesting interventions. You have different perspectives and you are all sitting on important positions when it comes to developing the work against trafficking in human beings for sexual purposes. From the United Nations to the European Union, from Ukraine to Spain to Sweden, I really think uh, that you can make sure that you can cont contribute to strengthen the cooperation and deepen understanding that is necessary in this field. It is a shared responsibility to make sure that everything possible is done to combat this despicable crime. I will now welcome our high-level panel to make their way down to the audience again and welcome onto stage our moderator for the next panel, Anna Ekstedt, Ambassador at Large for Combating Trafficking in Human, in human Beings in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. Thank you. Your Majesty, Excellencies, distinguished participants and dear colleagues. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this session where we will be discussing the uh, international and institutional and legal framework on addressing the demand for trafficking for sexual exploitation. My name is Anna Ekstedt and I'm the Swedish ambassador for combating trafficking in persons and I've been given the great honor to be moderating this expert panel that we have ahead of us here today. And in the panel we will be discussing what are we actually talking about when we're talking about the demand. Uh, we all know that there is an obligation to address the demand, to tackle the demand, but what does it actually mean in practice and how far are we going today and how far should we be going? What should we be aiming at when we're talking about addressing the demand for trafficking for sexual exploitation? I would like to call up the expert panel I have in front of me. So it's Ilias Chatsis, chief of the human trafficking and migrant smuggling section of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime. Diane Schmidt, the EU anti-trafficking coordinator and Valiant Ritchie, the OSCE Special Representative and Coordinator for Combating Trafficking in Human Beings. And we also have uh, Kevin Highland, OBE, and uh, strategic, uh, Strategy Director of the Santa Marta Group. And last but not least, Dalia Leinarte, who is also a member and former chair of the UN Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And I should also mention that we should have also in this panel had uh, a survivor voice from Gabriela Schankul Wolf Wolfe, the Swedish ombudsman against commercial sexual exploitation of children. She is unfortunately she has unfortunately fallen ill, but that means that I will be <laughs> uh, targeting you even more with questions. So be prepared. Uh, so, the UN protocol to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons indeed obliges states to discourage the demand that fosters trafficking in human beings for sexual exploitation. This also follows by the CEDAW convention that we will hear more about. And we also have, this is a requirement of the regional legal instruments, both within the EU anti-trafficking directive and also in the Council of Europe convention on action against trafficking in human beings. We'll be hearing more on these different instruments today. And as I mentioned, we are all aware about the fact that we need to address the demand. But what are we actually talking about? How can this be done? We have heard about the Swedish model, the Swedish the equality model that actually uh, has a legislative approach to addressing the demand. But there are many other ways that a demand could be addressed through. Uh, we have the instruments talking about enhancing knowledge, changing norms, educating ourselves, educating relevant staff, etc. So I'm keen to hear uh, from the examples that you could provide us with today. And 
uh, I would actually like to start by and also just maybe say that we have seen in Sweden, which we also have discussed, we heard our Minister of Justice already saying that we have seen a normative change in society. It was also raised by Her Majesty the Queen on the fact that legislative legis legislation actually do have a normative effect in society. But there are many other ways. Uh, and uh, but with the legislation, there are also you're given tools to the different actors to actually act upon the legislation to the police, the law enforcement, social services providers, etc. And uh, I also want to sort of highlight the fact that we are in this crisis of Ukraine. So also putting this in the context of. Uh, following the Russian invasion of, against Ukraine, how we can even more enhance our efforts. And that's why it's the discussion here today is even more pertinent on sort of what can we actually do jointly to raise this issue and keep it high on the agenda. So we'd like to start with you now, Ilias. <laughs> uh, and the UN protocol is indeed the main and the first legal instrument to address trafficking in persons, and that was in the, from the year 2000. And you recently, the UNODC recently published your uh, Global Trafficking in Persons report. I was just wondering before, sort of to set the framework here, could you just give us a few highlights of this report? What were your sort of main findings? What are the most pressing needs when it comes to addref addressing trafficking in human beings today on a global scale? And also what does your findings actually tell us about the need to address the demand for trafficking for sexual exploitation? Please. Thank you, thank you, Anna. And, um, before starting, I just want to add my voice to uh, thanking the uh, Swedish presidency for doing this event, this conference. Uh, it, it could not come at a more uh, uh, good time to discuss, especially since we are almost over a year since uh, you know, Ukraine's invasion. And um, our global report was issued at the beginning of the year, and it painted a very, very dark picture of uh, the global situation. We have seen for the first time in 20 years a reduction in victims identified. Globally, it was 11%. In some regions, it was 80%. And we have seen also a big reduction in the uh, prosecutions and the convictions. Globally, it was minus 27%, but in some regions, it was 60%. So this is it's, it's, it's more than a, a warning sign. I think it's really a wake-up call that we have to start thinking differently. Obviously, what we're doing in the current circumstances is not any longer working. And we have to rethink our approach to trafficking. We have to evaluate what we have done until now, what has worked, what has not worked. But definitely bringing these countries back to where they were before COVID is going to be an immense Herculean task. And not to talk about you know, bringing them even more uh, to have you know, a more advanced uh, response to, uh, to, this, to this crime. Um, I just want to say that for us, the, because there's sometimes a misunderstanding, the figures, the, the fact that we have less victims and less prosecutions and convictions does not mean there is less crime. On the contrary, it's less capacity of countries to identify victims and to prosecute and investigate. And I think this is where the, uh, the problem is. Now, uh, from our side, we have warned that you know, COVID will have a devastating effect on the developing world and the less uh, wealthy countries. And we think that this is just an indication of what has been the devastating effect of this, of this pandemic. On top of that, we have now conflicts, like the conflict in Ukraine that has global repercussions. You know, food prices, uh, um, uh, fuel prices in, uh, in, in many parts of the world increasing because of this the massive flow of, uh, of refugees into the European Union and other countries. And, um, in our data, sexual exploitation is still very prevalent, but we have also um, an increasing, and I think that's maybe the positive element, we have for the first time an increasing capacity of countries to detect different forms of, uh, of trafficking, especially what I call polycriminality, polytrafficking, victims traffic for different purposes. So a victim of sexual exploitation also forced into labor. Uh, into forced labor or, uh, you know, into drug trafficking. And we see about 10% of the cases detected in this period have been cases of, of, of multiple types of trafficking. We see a lot of violence in trafficking, 
uh, in this particular period. In 90% of all the cases detected, there was some form of violence. In 10% of the cases, we had extreme violence used. And of course, women and girls have been the majority of the, uh, of the victims that have suffered you know, this type of violence. Now, um, there's a new thinking required. And what we have to see is sexual exploitation, forced labor, um, forced criminality as, as different aspects of one crime which is trafficking in persons. Victims are used from one type of exploitation to the other, and we have to see how best we can address this. Addressing trafficking now in silos, I don't think is going to work any longer. And I think that's my call today, is to start thinking differently, and maybe collectively we can come up with some suggestions and some ideas about how can we take this struggle forward. So, as for the beginning, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. You're not done yet. I, I will continue with some questions for you. Uh, thank you for that uh, depressing picture, though, that we see more f forms of multiple exploitation or poly polytrafficking, as you called it, that people are being exploited for different forms of exploitation. Uh, but also the fact that we see a reduction in identification and also a reduction in prosecutions. But I'm thinking then, from your point of view, from the uh, Palermo Protocol against trafficking and Article 9.5 in the pro protocol that actually obliges states to address the demand. From your point of view, how, can, how should we focus more on the demand side? And what can you from the UN do to actually support member states in addressing the demand? Thank you. Maybe to remind everyone that, you know, what Article, traf uh, Article 9 calls for, which is basically it recognizes the fact that a criminal justice approach alone will not work for the prevention of this crime. And it basically calls on countries to um, adopt a series of measures. They can be legislative measures, but they can also be measures of other type, like educational, social, or cultural, to um, alleviate the factors and, and reduce demand for uh, trafficking. Persons. Because crime is driven by demand. So if you reduce the demand, you definitely have you know, an impact on, on this crime. Um, since the protocol, the discussion has moved on a lot, and a lot of countries now adopt measures and adopt policies like uh, legislation, like the one that Sweden has and other countries are, are uh, uh, considering, uh, to criminalize the, uh, the purchase of services from trafficking victims. Um, this is something that at UNODC we very much sort of portray as one of the measures that can be can have a positive effect on, on, this, uh, on this struggle. It's part of our, all of our tools and of our discussions. Within the UN itself, I think we're at a time where, um, unfortunately, discussions are very polarized over issues that in the past, you know, it, it was commonplace to discuss, like gender, mm -hmm. is becoming a very polarizing issue in, in many of our fora, especially regarding crime prevention. And I think that's something that we have also collectively, and you, the member states, see how we can we can move uh, forward into this discussion and basically cover also a lot of the ground lost the last couple of years. We're basically discussing about also civil society, the role of women. You know, there's, there's a kind of regression in, uh, in, the, in the position of some states in, in this discussion. Um, I would also like to say that, you know, public awareness is also a very important element of, uh, of this uh, effort to reduce uh, demand and to reduce, to increase understanding of the crime. And I have been in this job now for a couple of years and I have seen tens of campaigns, you know, different ones. And I think we're now at a stage where we're moving beyond the posters, beyond the TV ads, beyond the spots, to basically a much more thorough um, approach. And it's, I think, the case of Ukraine, which I think is one of the very positive awareness campaigns that I have seen. And I think uh, the fact that it was at different levels, you know, NGOs, governments, international organizations, um, uh, you know, uh, individuals participating, I think had a positive effect on what has already been discussed, which is the um, relatively uh, small number of cases that we see. And I hope it stays like this. Any case is too much, but still it's, it's, uh, it's something to, uh, to, to fight for. And I think what we need to do in the, uh, in the future is to look at this example, see what it worked in this campaign, in this public awareness, see how we can replicate it elsewhere, and see what can we learn from it 
to basically you know, have the same effect in another uh, circumstance. I think one of the elements that was very important in this was uh, Ukraine's sort of buying into this campaign and the involvement of NGOs from Ukraine, the fact that it was also in, 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 the la in different languages. There are a lot of elements in this public awareness effort that have been extremely uh, sort of uh, new. And I think that's what we need to, uh, to look for. So I think also public awareness is a quite important element. And we have to learn from what we did well to see how we can use it in the future. Thank you very much. And I can only agree with you on the fact that it's a polarized, polarized picture of addressing the demand. But I see more and more also an increase of an understanding that this is something that needs to be done independent of national legislation. And also thanking for raising the issue of the, the situation regarding Ukraine, and that we also that's why we are also here today. The fact that we are when we are raising the issue and talking about the issue, we're make, making sure that it's being kept high on the agenda, and that could be an example for the work ahead of us as well. Thank you, Ilas. And now Diane Schmidt. Uh, as we also heard from the commissioner, uh, the EU has done a lot since the Russian invasion of Ukraine in order to ensure that we prevent trafficking in human beings for sexual exploitation. Uh, all forms of exploitation are equally important to address, but today we're discussing specifically sexual exploitation and also to avoid that people are being exploited in prostitution. In the beginning of the year, the EU Commission now also presented its proposed amendments to the EU anti-trafficking directive in order to strengthen the rules that prevent and combat trafficking in human beings. We also heard Commissioner Johansson mentioning this. And one of the suggestions is to step up the demand reduction in the EU and beyond by making it, making it a criminal offence for people to knowingly use services provided by victims of trafficking. Uh, could you just please explain the reason behind this suggestion? What are the expected results of this amendment when it comes to discouraging the demand? Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, Her Majesty, Ministers, uh, dear participants. I see a lot of uh, faces I know, a lot of stakeholders being here. I think it's extremely important, as uh, you mentioned also, Anna, to, to raise awareness about trafficking human beings. Because, as Commissioner Ilva Johansson also said, the majority of victims are EU citizens. And sometimes it is also forgotten that trafficking in human beings in, is happening here in the European Union. So what's the reason why we, uh, the European Commission made this proposal? Uh, first of all, uh, demand is part of the comprehensive approach uh, of the European Union. It's part of our actions which are in the uh, European Union strategy, which goes from protection to prosecution with uh, the prevention and of course partnership with uh, different stakeholders, including uh, non-EU countries. Um, reducing the demand is really extremely important. Why? Because uh, criminals uh, organize uh, crime groups, make a lot of money. Commissioner Johansson mentioned the 14 billion which are made every year. This is only in relation to sexual exploitation. Then you have all the rest of the money which comes from forced criminality, which comes from begging, which comes from uh, organ trafficking, which comes from labor exploitation. So there's a lot of money behind. And as long as criminals can make the money, uh, we will not be able to address the crime. And this is why it's so important to, to deal with the demand. To deal with the demand for cheap labor, to deal with uh, the demand for sexual services. And uh, currently the anti-trafficking directive, which dates, dates back to 2011, foresees already uh, that, uh, or encourage member states to criminalize the knowing use of services from victims of trafficking, but it's not mandatory. And we realize that uh, member states have very different legislation in this area. It's also a very sensitive topic, I must say, a difficult topic in some member states with different positions. But the fact that the legislation is so different uh, makes also that the legal framework in the member state is fragmented. And this does not necessarily help in relation 
to uh, cross-border cooperation. It does also not help in the sense that you will have traffickers who will choose rather one member state than another member state to make their business because the legislation is not the same, including, by the way, on, on penalties uh, for traffickers. So, um, taking also into account that the legislation is, is quite old, more than 10 years uh, old, and also that there are other uh, evolutions in the meantime, the Commission made this proposal and one of the changes Changes, as Commissioner Johansson also mentioned already, is to make it mandatory uh, for member states uh, to criminalize the knowing use of services coming from victims of trafficking. We do not make the difference between different forms of trafficking. This can be sexual exploitation, but it can also be labor exploitation. Uh, so it's really services who are coming from the victims. We are not speaking about the, the traffickers here. We are speaking about the users. And uh, obviously, this would be a big step forward. I recall some discussions during the last uh, negotiations of the, the direct I was not in charge of trafficking human beings, but it was not possible to find an agreement between the member states. Uh, the discussions have started in the, in the Council and uh, I have the impression that it goes into the, the right direction. We are, of course, at the beginning of the negotiations between the Council and uh, the European Parliament, uh, but I really welcome the priority the Swedish Presidency is giving to this file and I'm also very grateful for the Spanish Presidency to take it over and to have it as a priority, which means also that probably the European Parliament will manage to, to adopt it together with the Council before the European election. We should, however, not forget that re demand reduction is only one part of the general approach, the global approach of the European Commission. And also in the, in the uh, proposal the, the Commission put on the table, we, we we also propose to add uh, illegal adoption, it was mentioned by the, by the minister, illegal adoption and forced marriages uh, to, to the different forms of, uh, of trafficking more explicitly because we noticed that if it's not mentioned in the EU legislation, member states do not introduce it in the national legislation and as Elias also just said, there are new forms of trafficking which are coming up. We also propose to make it mandatory for uh, man to have mandatory sanctions for legal persons uh, because labor exploitation is growing. It does not necessarily mean that there's more labor exploitation, but probably it's a good sign in the sense that uh, labor exploitation is better identified as also as a crime of trafficking human beings, that it's better detected and that's also probably because there's more awareness and also because labor inspectors and labor authorities are also more involved in, in, in uh, looking at trafficking in human beings. So which means also that a legal person needs to be sanctioned when they commit the crime of trafficking human beings. Uh, we propose also to make it mandatory in uh, member states to introduce uh, national referral mechanism, what are national referral mechanism? Uh, they help to better identify uh, victims, I hope at an early stage, but also to refer them to the, to the competent authorities for support and assistance. They exist in most of the member states, they should exist everywhere, and based on the fact if we have national referral mechanism in member states, we have to look also into the possibility to have trans border, a European referral mechanism, because there are so many uh, cross-border cases. Uh, we also propose uh, to make it mandatory for member states to collect data uh, on trafficking human beings in relation to victims, in relation to traffickers. For the moment, it's not mandatory. Uh, we base, of course, ourselves on the, on the data um, to also uh, look at what is needed from a legislative point of view, from an operational point of view, from a financial support point of view. Uh, so this is the global approach, but demand is really a a big part of it. I uh, would also like to mention one point, which uh, you have member states who have more victims uh, of their own nationality uh, in, the, in the European Union. So, of course, you have differences um, among the member states. But those member states who are the country of origin of most of the victims, they say, if you have a pull factor in the other member states, Due to the demand, obviously, we have also problems, problems to address trafficking in human beings in our country because there is the demand elsewhere. 
And so, again, this also explains why we need to act on demand, but also why we need to have a comprehensive approach with all the member states. Thank you. Thank you so much for... Thank you for laying out the details on the suggested amendments in the EU directive uh, that is also currently being negotiated by colleagues at the Ministry of Justice. And, uh, and also the fact that you also mentioned the importance of uh, cooperation between, of course, countries of origin and countries of destination. And that's equally important also when addressing the demand, that the demand is there when we're also working together to try to combat this phenomena. But I also wanted to ask you, Diana, about the fact that we already today, um, in the anti-trafficking directive, following Article 18, uh, have the uh, article that says that member states should discourage the demand that fosters all forms of trafficking. And what specific measures do you think are relevant in addressing trafficking for sexual exploitation? And how is you in your role, how are you able to support member states? And also, could you give some examples of where you have seen that measures that could actually work to address the demand. That would be very interesting to hear from you. I think the first point which is important is, of course, that legislation is an uh, important instrument, but it's, you cannot solve everything through legislation. So obviously you need to have other actions, and uh, it was already mentioned today, I mean, awareness raising is important. It's important also to have uh, to have uh, training and to have uh, also education, but training for all those and information for all those who come into contact uh, with potential victims of trafficking human beings. And uh, this can be law enforcement authorities, border guards, uh, doctors, uh, social workers. Uh, so there are, there are different stakeholders who can come in contact and they have also to be able to identify the signs of uh, trafficking in human beings, also, of course, for, for, for sexual exploitation. Uh, I would also say I think it's extremely important to, to have education of young people to explain also what are the risks, and not only offline, of course, online, because trafficking in human beings is moving more and more online nowadays. Almost every uh, case has... Uh, uh, an online dimension, either people are recruited online uh, or through social media, they are exploited online, uh, the transport is organized online, money laundering is done online, payments are done online. So the online dimension is extremely important, and which means also uh, that not only we have to do something from a legislative point of view uh, for, for the online dimension, but we have probably also to work even more with uh, uh, with internet and uh, information companies and social media in order that they raise awareness about the risk of trafficking human beings, but they also monitor what is going on on the, the different networks. Uh, and we have uh, a dialogue uh, with, um, uh, with these companies in the context of the European uh, Internet uh, Forum, so this will also be a, a priority for, for the future. Uh, what is also extremely important is, um, as the cross-border cooperation was already mentioned, and the cross-border cooperation also uh, between law enforcement authorities and judicial authorities uh, with the help of, uh, uh, of uh, Europol and Eurojust and other agencies. Uh, CEPOL also is organizing training for law enforcement authorities. Uh, uh, I think this cross-border cooperation is extremely important and has taken part uh, place also in the context of Ukraine, where more focus was put on cross-border cooperation uh, in relation to people arriving from Ukraine. This happened offline and also online, there was a big hackathon where police from different member states and judicial authorities have screens through different platforms and I have identified victims, uh, not only platforms uh, where there were problems, but also victims of uh, trafficking and perpetrators. What I always said, I'm, I'm, I think this, this is, does not only help uh, the different authorities to work better together because they do it then on a specific or on different specific cases, they learn from it, but it helps also policymakers and uh, to, to, to better understand what's the problem. And what I also say, 
Then we should not forget during these action days, of course, victims are identified, traffickers are identified, but then, of course, the work with the victims have also st to start because they have to be protected. And the traffickers have to be brought to justice. So in this general approach, we should not forget that it's also, of course, victims have to be protected and the support has to be there and also they, there must be the capacity for, for civil society organizations also to support victims. But it's also important to have, after the investigations, to have the prosecution and to have the sanctions. Because if there are no clear penalties and clear sanctions against traffickers, the crime will not go away. And I think there, in the European Union, and in some member states, we can also do more in order to uh, criminalize and to give really clear sanctions to, to the criminals, because this will be a deterrent effect and will also help to stop trafficking human beings and to prevent it from happening. As long as criminals do not understand that they risk something and they can continue to make so much money, I think we will not have a solution. Thank you very much, Diane, also for highlighting the fact that we need to work with uh, different actors in, prevent in prevention and in demand reduction, maybe not the actors that you initially would think of when it comes to counter-trafficking. And also the online challenge, of course, extremely difficult, uh, and also where we have different legislation in different member states on prevention and targeting demand, and also on prostitution, procuring, etc., which makes it even more challenging, I would say. And we need to make sure that how to make the online dimension a safe space and a, pre uh, and a tool for prevention rather than a tool for exploitation. But now, uh, moving on, um, let's see, you also have a PowerPoint presentation. Wow, well, let's see, uh, is this for you? Okay, sorry, I did. Oh. I think it is. <laughs> Should be. So, um, I would like then uh, to ask you about, we've heard about addressing the demand, but still I'm not sure that we're all aware about what is actually the demand. I will ask you to elaborate on this. How can demand, the demand that fosters trafficking for sexual exploitation actually be understood? What is the role of the buyers in this chain of exploitation? Clearly, without the buyers, we wouldn't have trafficking for sexual exploitation. But what does also the overall uh, obligation to address the demand look like? And what efforts do you see are needed? And what are also, I also know that you issued your report on demand, so it would be great if you could share some of your main findings from this report. So please. Thank you very much, Your Majesty, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I think this is an incredibly critical conference on a critical topic. And I can't um, express how much it means to me that uh, such high-level support has been offered today for this topic because that is incredibly unusual in this world. And so this is, a, I think, a really important moment. Uh, I want to start by thanking Sweden and Anna in particular for organizing this conference. Uh, and I want to start my answer with a quick case study because I think it helps explain this issue. When Russia invaded Ukraine last February, they triggered the flight of millions of people, mostly women and children, to the West. And while many of us were trying our best to help these people seeking refuge, something else was happening online. Thomson Reuters registered huge spikes in online searches for terms related to gaining sexual access to Ukrainian refugees. Terms like Ukrainian porn, Ukrainian escorts, Ukrainian refugee porn, and Ukrainian rape spiked 200 to 600 percent across multiple countries and multiple languages. And men were not only searching online, but they were also acting as well. For example, in March here in Sweden, 30 out of 38 men arrested for trying to buy sex were specifically seeking Ukrainians. Now, we were not the only ones to notice this trend. Prostitution websites reported huge increases in interest for Ukrainians on their platforms. For example, Escorts Ireland, screenshot here, gleefully noted a 250% increase in interest and offered sex buyers, and I quote, the opportunity to live out their war-inspired fantasies. Following these spikes, we quickly saw efforts by exploiters to recruit Ukrainian women and girls in the sex industry. These suspicious offers were placed in channels used by Ukrainians to find housing or work. 
And sure enough, about six months into the war, a company called Web IQ in the Netherlands reported a tenfold, tenfold increase in the advertisement of Ukrainians on sexual service websites that they track. This case study shows how demand for sexual services incentivizes the recruitment of vulnerable individuals to meet that demand. Huge spikes in interest in March were followed just six months later by a tenfold increase in Ukrainians being advertised online. The more demand there is, the larger the market there is, the more money that can be made, and the greater incentive to exploit. In this case, it was Ukrainian escorts, but it's not hard to understand that in other times, on other days, it will be Romanians or Chinese or Nigerians. We often think of sexual exploitation and trafficking in binary terms, a trafficker and a victim. But this case study shows that the critical importance must also be paid to the sex buyer. And to understand how demand incentivizes this market for exploitation, men seek to buy sex. That encourages pimps to profit off the sale of sex, which leads to the desire to uh, conduct trafficking. This is the sequence of events that happens and how demand inspires and incentivizes and fosters exploitation. This reality, this relationship between demand and supply, if you will, is exactly why the Palermo Protocol included Section 5 of Article 9. It says that all state parties, every single one, and it's one of the most successful conventions of all time, over 180 countries have signed it. All countries are required to discourage the demand that fosters exploitation that leads to trafficking. Now, what does that phrase exactly mean? Well, foster, as I said, means to encourage. And while the protocol doesn't define sexual exploitation, it gives one critical example, the exploitation of the prostitution of others, which is not merely forced prostitution, which we often hear, but as UNODC has described quite accurately, it is third-party profiteering, also known as pimping. What this means, is that the international obligation to address demand in the protocol is an expansive one. We often hear about the need to address the demand for trafficking. This means that somebody specifically demands or desires a trafficking victim, but that is not what the law says. A second, slightly broader concept is to address the demand that pays for trafficking victims, knowingly or unknowingly. This is a big challenge on its own. Traffickers make $99 billion a year from men paying for sex with trafficking victims. That is greater profits than the Apple Corporation. It's a huge financial incentive. But the protocol, again, is even broader than this. It requires countries to address the demand that fosters exploitation. In other words, the demand that encourages pimping that leads to trafficking. In this context, we did a research project that Anna just mentioned on efforts to address demand. And you can find our paper in this room, but here are some key conclusions. Countries, first of all, have a mandatory obligation, as I said, to take steps to address demand. But they often don't do it or don't do it well. In 20 out of the 57 countries that we reviewed, we couldn't identify a single initiative to address demand, despite it being an international legal obligation. And where states do take action, they don't do it very well. They often stick with uh, low-impact, short-term, one-off uh, awareness campaigns, rather than more effective deterrence and disruption initiatives. And finally, what we found is that the criminal justice laws that are used, if they are used, are incredibly ineffective. Perhaps the most common mistake here is, relying, is the heavy, heavy reliance on statutes criminalizing only the knowing use of trafficking victims. What this means is that you can only prosecute somebody if you can prove that they knew it was a trafficking victim who they had sex with. That tiny little circle that I showed you earlier. First, as I said, this is the demand for trafficking, and it's not what the protocol had in mind at all. But second, this doesn't reflect reality. As uh, the UN Special Rapporteur for Trafficking in Persons said a few years ago, prostitute users are typically incapable of distinguishing and or unmotivated to differentiate between prostituted persons who've been subjected to the illicit means of trafficking. I think that's a fantastic summary of what we're talking about. However, I like this one really 
as well, who was a sex buyer I prosecuted. If I'm going to be honest, I knew about the violence the women experienced, I just wasn't thinking about it at the time. Well then, carry on, right? This is absolutely ridiculous. We cannot have our legal system so constrained that we cannot hold res people responsible due to willful ignorance. Therefore, we must develop much more effective criminal justice systems, and we should be using strict liability strat statutes that hold people accountable for any sex purchase from a trafficking victim, regardless of their knowledge, or criminalizing all sex buying, which be better matches the full scope of the pr protocol that I described earlier. We must also move beyond adoption to implementation. Statutes only work when they are implemented robustly. But Anna, you asked what else needs to be done, and let me end with this, and I think it was a fantastic point by Minister Stromer earlier. You cannot prosecute your way out of this problem. You have to supplement with prevention. In fact, criminal statutes should be the last measure of accountability. If we want to stop exploitation, we need to invest in prevention to stop the harm before it happens. And to do this effectively, we need a holistic, society-based response that engages all sectors, business, tech, education, the general public. 20 years ago, the protocol gave us clear guidance by advocating that all states adopt and implement legislative, social, cultural, and educational measures. And I think that message rings true today, and we should listen to it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Val, for this thorough explanation and also very depressing figures from Ukraine regarding the searches for exploitation of Ukrainian women online following the Russian invasion. Uh, and also for underlining uh, sort of the, the, the concept of fostering, what fosters actually means in the protocol and sort of how it, how it best could be explained. Uh, I actually want to ask you one more question in this holistic approach that you're also mentioning the tech side. And we did have a joint event together uh, during the UN CSW a few weeks ago in New York, also on the technique, uh, the online dimension of trafficking. And you've also done uh, impressive work on that. So I just wanted to, if you could just give a few highlights on the best way to sort of address the demand on the online dimension, that would be great. Well, I think the, the I'll make two quick points. One, Diane just raised a few minutes ago, which is a great one, and that is that we really do need to address this online aspect. And um, what I call, I call it the infrastructure of exploitation. It is the system that, that efficiently brings buyers and traffickers and victims together um, and, and makes the process seamless and easy and lower risk. And if we want to address this infrastructure, then we need regulation. We have tried mandatory, or excuse me, voluntary approaches to this, and they have failed. And I think the companies know that they have failed. So mandatory regulation is critical. Now, if we are going to require companies to search their, do, their supply chains and conduct due diligence for forced labor six tiers down in their supply chains, then why can't we ask social media platforms or sexual service websites to conduct the same due diligence there. They should be conducting age verification, consent verification, and so forth. This is the first one. The second one is, is that we can't just hope for the best with efforts to address demand. We can't just sit back and, and, and expect an NGO to launch a, 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 an awareness campaign on 20,000 euros. We need to institutionalize anti-demand efforts into our systems, and the best place to do that is in national action plans. We studied all of the national action plans across the OSC region and demand was consistently omitted from those action plans as being any part of the strategic response. That is the key place where countries can build a comprehensive holistic framework that I discussed earlier and institutionalize it over multiple years. Thank you so much. So, moving over to Kevin Highland, OBE. As a, you're currently a strategic director in the Santa Marta Group, but you're also the former UK anti-slavery commissioner. And you've also uh, been a member of the uh, Council of Europe, the group of experts on action against trafficking in human beings, Greta, that monitors the implementation uh, of the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking. Uh, from your experience, uh, what is sort of 
what specific measures do you think are relevant in order to successfully address the demand for sexual exploitation? And could you give us a few examples of that? Thank you, Your Majesty, Ministers, uh, Delegates, and Anna, thank you for inviting me here today and organizing this event. I think we need to start where Ilya started to say that at the moment around the world, um, we're now seeing numbers of people identified as traffic victims declining. Last year, globally, 90,000 victims with 5,800 prosecutions. That number is shamefully low. And if we look at how that number equates against global figures of potentially 50 million victims, that means there's a 99.99% of getting away with this crime. So if you're a criminal, it's good business. If you're a victim, it's bad business because less than 1% of the time you're going to be identified. So if we're going to address demand, we need to up the game. We really need to up the game. And events like this begin that process. The fact that we've got such high level support here, as uh, was already said, is that beginning for change. But what do we need to do to address demand? Well, we need to put this category where it needs to be. This should fall in the category of other serious organized crime, like terrorism, like gun running, like drugs, which are debated and resourced extremely well. We need to look at the fact that millions of girls and women and men and boys are exploited daily. The demand is out of control. But we need to invest in that. And of course, the Council of Europe Convention uh, at its Article 6 requires, it's not a request, it's a requirement to have measures that reduce demand. But that demand needs to go across the board and be effective, like we see here in Sweden. It needs to give a clear message that we're going to tackle demand. But it needs to be much wider. Demand, I believe, there are six principles to deal with. First of all, we need to look at business and government procurement, business culture and government procurement. We need to make sure we're setting out the store that they cannot be funding or engaging in trafficking. Taxpayers' money cannot be ending up funding trafficking, whether it's domestic procurement or international. And business culture needs to be regulated for, as we are seeing with new legislation in Germany, where there will be sanctions. We need technology where we know there's been an increased amount of exploitation to be legally controlled. How is it we allow the technology firms to go into our children's bedrooms to operate freely and create this demand so that people can watch exploitation happening in the Philippines and demand two children and watch it from London, from Stockholm, from Dublin? And yet, there is no legislation to deal with the people who are carrying that from one country to other. Now, the UK is looking at an online bill to actually create criminal offences and place the responsibility with the big tech companies. Fourthly, we need to look at the money this creates, the money that is paid for prostitution, but much wider, the money that is earned from the brothels, from the taxi drivers. All of that money is tainted but also from businesses, from those who do organ harvesting, from those who do adoption that we heard about from the Spanish minister, which is a crime in Australia. We need to start looking at that money, estimated at 150 billion a year. The global giving of OECD money for development is 187 billion, yet trafficking takes 150 billion out of the economy. Imagine if we can start putting that back in as money for good. Fourth is we need to use the international instruments properly as they were intended, as we heard from Val. They were intended to do things, not to be an a la carte approach. We'll take what we like. Let's use what was intended and let's use it for what it was intended for. The same with human rights. It's very clear what they are, but we have an a la carte approach. We need to change that. The fifth principle is the international instruments. I was delighted to hear that the International Criminal Courts is looking at a prosecution for human trafficking against Putin. 
absolutely needed. But there are other countries, other world leaders, other officials who need that as well. We have 27 countries in the world in conflict at the moment where we know people are displaced. And the demand for those people, the demand to bring them into other worlds is shocking. And the sixth, and probably the most important, and we see it here today, thankfully, is leaders. Leaders in positions to use their leadership for good. To use their leadership to tell the world, we've got to stop this and we've got to adopt measures. And I'm going to finish with a very short story on a leader that I met when I was in Nigeria. It was a woman in a leper colony. She suffered with leprosy and she invited me into her home. She spoke broken English. She explained to me that years ago, our worlds came and cured them of leprosy. And she thanked me and she pointed outside to the children playing football with a rag and with a very bad football pitch. And then she said to me, but now they're healthy, you're back and you're taking them for your brothels, for your sex and for your forced labor. And she said to me, can you just go back to your world and tell your people to stop it? That's the policy, that's the process. And I think we need to do those six things I said, deliver, deliver what was intended, and then we can get to a point where the demand becomes unable, where we disempower the traffickers and we empower the victims. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kevin, for crucial points. And also, like you said, this is not an a la carte uh, situation. We, have to, we are obliged to take the measures needed to address and stop this exploitation. And uh, great to see that we have leaders here today and also experts here today to actually take this forward. Uh, I wanted to just ask you one more thing, also from your previous experience as a Greta member, also on the knowing use of services of victims that is also required or recommended to member states that to have this provision. Have you seen any results or could you sort of say anything on that in terms of uh, using this legal instrument? I think there's been weak implementation of that, the knowing use, and there's always arguments by the lawyers and the police officers, like myself, a former police officer, who will argue, well, how do you prove the knowing? But every crime requires proving the knowing. But then we can have offences, as we've got here, with strict liability in Sweden. Now, if we really want to protect vulnerable women and girls, then we need to find the way of proving the knowing. We need to make strict liability. If we're really serious about it, if we're not serious about it, let's say we're not serious about it. But if we are serious about it, then we will work out ways to do that. And the UK brought in legislation which was not knowing, it didn't require a knowing, but the victim had to be trafficked or exploited. Now that was used on about nine or ten times since it was introduced about ten years ago. So it's not been used properly and it's been made very complex to use. We do see that France has brought in legislation that has been extensively used. Here in Sweden we see legislation. But there are alternatives as well, which makes me wonder because in the UK, for example, there's not a strict liability. But the armed forces, and in particular the army, brought in a military law to say that it is an offence for serving members of Her Majesty's forces to use prostitution anywhere in the world. Because, obviously, there is a problem, as we know, in conflict, particularly in certain parts of the world where the military personnel have been found responsible for sexual exploitation. So this is setting out standards. This is setting out standards by the leaders in the armed forces. But we also see that you know, there are other ways of um, approaching this through education, through, as Her Majesty said, working with people when they're young, changing the way that boys approach things. This is not a women's problem. It's a men's, man's made problem. And we need to address that. So looking at demand, we need to look at all of the issues that are there on demand. And legislation, as Val said, it should be the last attempt. It's the last ditch. It's when everything else has failed. And we do see some good measures. 
But the one thing we don't see across the EU, across the Council of Europe, or across the world, is proper resourcing, proper leadership, and then actually people standing up and saying, we are going to protect women and girls, we are going to look at the gender aspects of this, and even if it's unpopular, we're going to make it happen so that girls and women are equal. Thank you. Yes, uh, and thank you. Uh, we will also have a discussion tomorrow. I should say we have a specific pan panel on legislative models to address the demand with examples from different member states. So there will be more chances to hear about specific examples. I also want to thank you for raising the issue of military forces. Needless to say, also that applies also to Swedish military forces abroad that you cannot... Uh, by sexual services or exploit people in prostitution. And that comes also with many international organizations such as the UN, etc. But look different in different member states. Uh, but now, Dalia, I want to move over to you as a member and former chair of the UN Committee on all Elimination of All Discrimination Against Women. We have heard about the different international regulations, the EU Protocol, the EU, uh, the EU Directive, the Palermo Protocol and the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. But in addition to this, we also have CEDAW, a very important instrument that we never should forget when we're talking about is issues that puts anti-discrimination of women high on the agenda. It's a bill of rights for women, but also sets out how countries actually can make sure that women guarantee the enjoyment of those rights. And following Article 6 in the uh, CEDAW Convention, all state parties should take the appropriate measures, including legislation, to suppress all forms of trafficking in women and exploitation or prostitution of women. And as a, from your perspective, uh, could you please guide us through this article and also the measures that states are obliged to take? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, uh, Your Majesty, and ministers, and honorable audience, and also participants of this uh, panel. Uh, I really am very grateful uh, to you for this opportunity to, to introduce um, the CEDO's jurisprudence, jurisprudence on um, trafficking in women and girls which is focused actually on Article 6, as you said, and it's the shortest one in the convention. Actually, it's actually one uh, sentence. So the CEDO committee recognizes uh, that despite the existing anti-trafficking legal and policy frameworks at the national, regional, and international levels, women and girls continue to comprise the majority of detected victims of trafficking across the world and perpetrators enjoyed widespread impunity. And this is despite that it was mentioned here, uh, the diversification of forms of uh, trafficking. Examination of state parties' periodic reports reveal that the abuse of a position of vulnerability and the abuse of power power are the most common means used to commit trafficking crime, and that victims are often subjected to multiple forms of exploitation. Likewise, gendered analysis of trafficking reveals that the root causes of the crime lies, lies in sex-based discrimination, including the failure to address the prevailing economic and patriarchal structures which create the situation of vulnerability leading to women and girls being trafficked. So criminal laws are not enough, and here it already has been mentioned. It's essential to address the factors that heighten the risk of trafficking in particular, achieving gender equality and empowering and women and girls. So accordingly, identifying Addressing and eliminating the root causes are key to state parties' obligations to prevent trafficking and sexual exploitation uh, in women and girls. The Article 6 of the CEDAW Convention calls to address for following root causes. A, system, uh, systematic gender-based discrimination uh, creating the economic and social injustice experienced disproportionately by women and girls. 
B, situations of conflicts and humanitarian emergencies, including consequent displacement. C, discrimination in, in migration and asylum regimes, and the demand that fosters exploitation and leads to trafficking, especially the demand for, so, for sexual purposes. So it's really essential to address the factors that, again, I repeat, heighten the risks of, risks of trafficking, in particular, achieving gender equality and empowering of women and girls. The CEDAW committee also stresses that states parties bear a legal obligation to respect and ensure the rights that led down in the CEDAW convention to anyone within the power or effective control of that, uh, of that state party, even if not situated within its territory. The direct obligation of states parties to prevent, investigate, prosecute, and punish acts of trafficking in women and girls and offer address to victims extends to the acts of omissions of all perpetrators, including private persons, family members, and intimate partners, state-mandated actors and officials, organizations and businesses, as well as non-state actors, including uh, armed terrorist groups. And here, in this um, relation, in this last um, uh, para, and since we are talking and we are focused on, um, inevitably, on the Russian Federation um, uh, war against Ukraine, I would like to remind uh, you about rules of procedure of CEDO, it's para 48, uh, which allows for exceptional reporting uh, procedure that would be exercised for um, each state party under CEDO uh, convention. And the Russian Federation, of course, it's a state party under CEDO uh, convention. This rule of procedure that uh, allows to bring um, perpetrator uh, to uh, to, to Geneva before the CEDO uh, committee using uh, uh, power 48 of rule of procedure as exceptional reporting uh, was exercised uh, uh, over 40 years in the CEDO's uh, history only once. It happened in 2017 when I was, uh, uh, was a, a chair of the CEDO committee and we applied it in case of Myanmar. Uh, and actually, it was very successful, if, it, uh, if it's possible to, to describe uh, uh, this, this case, uh, successful in that, that uh, Myanmar's government, they came to, the, to, to Geneva, and we had a long day discussion um, uh, how how aggression happened, what uh, Pramila Patin said, the former member of the CEDAW committee, in, in terms of uh, Rohingya, uh, basically women and girls. So what I am saying, CEDAW uh, uh, CEDAW uh, committee might uh, exercise to bring uh, to to, uh, to to the life again, the rule of procedure 48, and to invite Russian Federation uh, before the CEDAW committee uh, and to have a dialogue about their, uh, their crimes committed in terms of trafficking in women and girls uh, in Ukraine and also, and also beyond the, the borders of Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you for that explanation and also interesting to hear about the, the potentials of using the reporting yeah. procedures. Thank you so much. I just also want to follow up with a question on how can we actually, I mean trafficking in human beings is a serious crime often committed by organized crime but it also comes from a 
gender inequalities and it's a form of violence, severe form of violence against women. And I'm just thinking from also from your long experience and from the CEDAW perspective, how can we sort of take stock in the work of long term work against gender based violence and also enhancing sexual health and reproductive health and rights with the work against exploitation in prostitution and trafficking? If you just could say a few words on that. Thank okay, you. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. And it has been said a lot uh, uh, about demand side uh, for the uh, sexual exploitation of women and girls or, or, or children, especially it was stressed by uh, the majesty. But I will add a few words. According to CEDAW general recommendation number 38, trafficking in women and girls for sexual exploitation persists due to state parties' failure to effectively discourage the demand that fosters exploitation and leads to trafficking. Persisting norms and stereotypes regarding male domination, the need to assert male control or power, enforce patriarchal gender roles, male sexual entitlement, cohesion and control which drive the demand for sexual exploitation of women and girls. Massive financial gains that has been mentioned by Kevin, with few risks due to the impunity are still widespread. And today, uh, the need to address the demand that fosters sexual exploitation is especially important, and we can um, see it during the dialogues with our state parties. This is in the context of digital technologies, which expo expose potential victims to increase the risk of trafficking. Digital technologies have opened new possibilities to bring positive impact on the societies. At the same time, they are posing new security challenges at both individual and state levels. The use of electronic currencies offers tools to hide personal information, such as identification of involved parties and location, and allow to make anonymous payments without disclosing the purpose of transaction. All of this facilitates those involved in trafficking. Demand channels through social media, dark web, and messaging platforms provide easy access to potential victims, thus increasing their vulnerability. The use of digital technology for trafficking poses special problems during global pandemics, as it happened with the last one. State parties face growth of trafficking in cyberspace and increased recruitment uh, for sexual exploitation online an increased demand for child sexual abuse material and technology facilitate child sex trafficking. As a response, state parties should call for the existing digital technology companies to increase transparency. Cooperate with technology companies in creating tools to detect online recruitment and identify traffickers. But to take all these and other measures on board in order to reduce the demand, state parties should have a very clear understanding that there is no such thing as sex work in general and sex work for which client can own a woman in exchange for uh, money. And, um, we do not have this unanimous um, uh, understanding among uh, state parties, 189 state parties and the uh, CEDO convention. The, the, only, the only hope is that we adopt the general, com general recommendation um, in 2021. And in this lengthy document, which um, explains how we should understand, how state parties should understand Article 6, and actually how we should understand the definition, exploitation of prostitution. So in this lengthy document, which becomes part of CEDAW uh, Convention, you wouldn't find a word sex work. There is no such thing in general recommendation. So it's, um, it's already a very clear message. 
uh, brought to 189 um, state parties uh, to the CEDO, but the work just, uh, uh, just started. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. We do have a few minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Uh, I think we should use this opportunity to ask a few questions to the panelists. Uh, and there should be a microphone somewhere in the room that could be used for this. Uh, please sort of state your name and also sh short questions to the audience, to, be able to the panelists, please. If there are any questions, you can raise your hands. We have one there, Olga, or? Yeah, sorry, I, I wasn't able to hold it myself. <laughs> Hello, my name is Olga Persson. I'm the president of Unison, uh, we, an association for 100 and women shelters in Sweden. And I have a question for Diane Smith. Uh, about the work in, in the EU. Uh, now, when you heard all the comments from the other panelists about uh, how to harmonize uh, the EU frame, framework uh, when it comes to the international framework. So, what are your comments now? Thank you very much. It's a very pertinent question. I must say that I'm not surprised about some of the interventions and comments which were made because there is already a quite long debate uh, in relation to how to address the debate, which uh, the demand which has taken place in the European Union and I think also worldwide. So what was proposed in the, uh, in the proposal of the European Commission uh, is the, the outcome of an in-depth evaluation and an in-depth consultation also. And I think we have to see in relation to the, to the legislation that if adopted, this would be already a big step forward. Uh, to have the criminalization of the knowing use of uh, services coming from victims of trafficking. Of course, one could go further and the directive, if adopted uh, like this, will be a minimum, which means that member states can have more stricter measures, but for the first time would have EU legislation which criminalizes the use of exploited services. And uh, as you know, discussions are going on in the Council and the European Parliament, and uh, we will see also what will come out from the discussions between the co-legislators. Of course, it was interesting also to hear everything else which uh, can be and is being done partly, can still be improved, uh, which is not legislation. And some, one point also I would like to underline, we did, uh, the European Commission addressed in the, in the proposal only some aspects. Huh? That being said, the implementation of the directive of the current legislation is also important and we will continue to work on the implementation, especially as regards the rights and the support to victims of trafficking and especially women and children. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any additional comments or questions? We have one over here. Yes, hello, my name is Kerstin Neuhaus and I'm from the Alliance Nordic Model in Germany. And in Germany, since 2016, we have a paragraph in our penal law punishing sex buyers who knowingly use forced women in prostitution. Since 2016, we had one case of a sex buyer um, who came to court because of that paragraph. So we can see that it doesn't work. And now my question to Mr. Highland is, um, you said if we're serious about proving, we have to find a way for proving. And that would be a good thing for Germany too. So my question is, do you have any ideas? How can we make that paragraph work? Yes, it's a, it's a very important question. And I will just give you um, something relevant to Germany, but also to the United States. I met legislators in Germany and in the United States who were very pro a liberal approach to prostitution and thought it should be regulated as a job. So I asked them, I said, when politicians and political leaders are looking at forms of work and they sometimes go and experience it. 
I've known politicians who have gone and experienced homelessness, who have gone and worked down the mines, who have gone and worked on trains or whatever it may be. And I said, can you find a politician or a member of a politician's family who will go and experience it for a night and then report back in the parliament? And they both changed their minds. The people that I said changed their minds about how they viewed it. But I think the legislation that you've got in Germany is very similar to the legislation in the UK, that um, you have to show that the person knew that that person was trafficked. There are ways of doing that if you can do very uh, sensitive and covert policing. But generally, these crimes, I don't know what it's like in Germany, but in the UK, it's a fine only. So on proportionality, you can't use... Uh, covert measures to prove the cases. Um, but if there were resources put to it, and you know, if there's been one prosecution in Germany, that means that a prosecution is possible. That's the first thing. But it means that the resources aren't being allocated. And so the legislation um, should be um, widened uh, to involve the trafficking and when somebody is arrested for trafficking, looking at the telephones, looking at who the people who are have been using the services and going backwards from there. That is when you will start to change the demand. But this process of just waiting and hoping and getting one or two cases just doesn't work. But I think that until we get to the point of like we're hearing that comes from the EU, whereby we make it very clear, like it is here in Sweden, and like it is in France, and like it is in Ireland. It's very clear. The message is very clear. Germany has taken leaps on its supply chain transparency. Okay, it's got a high threshold of when a company is liable to be prosecuted, but it's going to bring that down over years. That is a leap from an EU country to have that transparency supply chain with a sanction, a 4% sanction. So these ambitious targets are possible, but it needs people to push the politicians, it needs the EU to do its part, and it needs events like this to actually show what this is, that it is gender violence and it's abuse of women and girls. Thank you so much. Do we have one final question for the panel? Yes. Here. Hi, uh, my name is Elisa Thun. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs at Child 10, an organization based here in Sweden. Um, I was just wondering, um, you know, we were talking a lot about the legal framework, international legal framework, and also the international instruments, both in terms of the Palermo Protocol and also now the um, uh, new updated uh, uh, draft updates of the EU uh, directive. Um, I think we need to think a little bit new in terms of implementation, as we see that, you know, correct implementation of these instruments is, is lacking. Are there any thoughts on the panel on how to uh, motivate uh, correct implementation amongst member states? Thank you. Good question. Important questions. Yes, we have a very solid legal framework at, ha at our hands, uh, but how can we ensure implementation? If I could give you one minute each to answer that maximum, please. Understand. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I think uh, among all of us, only CEDO has uh, a mechanism, a very well established mechanism, how it would be possible to implement uh, uh, well adopted laws on, on the demand side, on uh, combating trafficking in women and girls, because we have 189 countries on, on board, which reports uh, to the CEDO on Article 6 every four years. But the problem is, as I, as I mentioned, when you are talking about the combating the demand, uh, the demand side, it inevitably should be linked with laws on um, uh, on prostitution and, uh, uh, and and how in general societies in all 189 countries understand what it means. Uh, 
uh, in various forms prostitution, like uh, criminalization of uh, clients, decriminalization on women uh, and girls in prostitution, uh, neither criminalization uh, of prostitution or, or criminalization prostitution, but not criminalization, cr criminalization on, of clients. So it's such a variety that it precludes us, it doesn't allow CEDO committee uh, somehow co coherently and with the power to convince the governments that, for example, only in two definitions, that the demand side should be reduced, that the demand side should be eliminated, and uh, the, the, the third, the most important uh, sentence, that prostitution, not even exploitation of prostitution, prostitution is gender-based violence, but we do not have this. And even right now, what we have in this attempt of on European um, uh, 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 European Union level, that criminalization of demand, which knows that commit crimes, crime just because uh, knowingly knows that the case uh, uh, is. Um, uh, is, is a trafficking case. It doesn't work like this. And according to me, frankly, it's one step backwards, even if to measure uh, this um, legislative framework to compare to general recommendation number 38, demand side is demand side. It, it should be combated without any exception. Thank you, Dalia. Anyone else who wants to uh, a final comment on uh, the importance of implementation? I think the, the, it's a really good point. And the thing is, uh, implementation has been weak because there's been a lack of investment, financial and political. It's also because um, there is very few sanctions. And what should be happening is that if companies, businesses or individuals are connected to trafficking, you know, companies and businesses and countries should be sanctioned by the World Bank and not be allowed to trade in certain areas. And that happens in the US with their Tariff Act. You, get, you can't trade with the US if you have goods that are made by child trafficking or forced labor, that they will not accept your goods. And when countries get sanctioned by that, they work hard to get those sanctions lifted. So we need to have sanctions, and that's why I was saying earlier about you know, using the international instruments, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, the International Criminal Courts, the EU, the African Union, all of those should have this as a priority, but looking at where sanctions should be. And you know, if you were involved in moving money for terrorism, you would be sanctioned enormously. Only yesterday in the UK, a, a major betting company got fined 19.2 million for not protecting its customers, those who are going into their shops gambling. They sanctioned them. Well, let's do the same for those who are exploiting women and girls. Let's sanction them. 19.2 million wakes you up. That's what we need to be doing. Those who are doing this as a business and a living, which those who are trafficking women and girls are doing, need to get the sanctions that are commensurate to the misery and the violence they're imposing on their trafficked people. Thank you, Kevin. Diane? Well, on implementation, as you know, uh, the Commission can launch infringement procedures or bring member states uh, in front of the Court of Justice if uh, legislation is not respected. Um, the EU directive for the moment is quite flexible on some of the elements and that's also why we made the proposal to make some of the articles mandatory like uh, the sanctions against legal persons, like the criminalization of the users, to give only a few examples. But we will continue to work on the implementation of the directive, uh, I would say in a soft way, not necessarily going to the Court of Justice, with uh, the national rapporteurs and the coordinators, there's an EU network and we come together on a regular basis. And that I think the, the future now that we have the proposal on the table, let's go, let's see how, where the negotiations go. 
but we have to work a little bit more together on the implementation. Look also if we need perhaps some guidelines which make implementation easier. And on the same, at the same time, I would like to underline again how important the rest is uh, to make also the implementation of the directive work in terms of prevention, awareness raising. And there, the European Commission has the intention to launch a EU-wide awareness raising campaign on the 18th of October, which is the European Day Against Trafficking in Human Beings, uh, but also in relation to law enforcement, judicial cooperation, and of course, protection of, of victims. So we'll continue to work on this, but I would like to to repeat what you also said, I think it, it must also be a priority in member states uh, at highest level and you need also to have the resources because if you don't have the resources also it's extremely difficult. Another difficulty we have with trafficking human beings, as was mentioned, is the evidence because the three conditions which have to be fulfilled to have trafficking human beings are sometimes very difficult to prove. And so together we have to continue, I think, all the stakeholders to, to work on this. Mm. Thank you. And Elias? Thanks. Um, I think on the implementation, um, it is as good as the state wants it to be. And this is an inherent default of the international criminal law justice system that, you know, it's the member states that have the capacity to implement or not implement. For us, we have a wealth of knowledge at the UN, we have a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience that we put at their hands, but it's up to them to really make it work. And for me, if you ask for my personal opinion, I fully agree with, with Kevin. That until human trafficking becomes a security issue, a threat to our societies, I don't think we will see you know, increased implementation. When human trafficking becomes as important as drug trafficking or as terrorism, with, of course, always the need to protect the victims, which is an important element and distinguishing factor. But as long as until the moment that trafficking becomes, in our minds, a threat to our societies, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that we will not see the levels of implementation that this, that this crime deserves. Thank you so much. Uh it, implementation uh, is as good as the states wants it to be. I think that's a good quote to end with. Uh, I also want to thank this panel for your incredible input during, during the panel. And it's given us quite a good and broad understanding of our obligations to address the demand. And thank you so much. The co discussions will indeed uh, continue throughout this conference. We will now shortly go for a coffee break. Um, and uh, I, once again, I also want to thank Her Majesty Queen Sylvia of Sweden for being here with us today and for your strong commitment uh, to this important issue. Thank you on behalf of the government and all of our organizers here. So thank you. And now, please, I would like all of us to rise for the Queen. Thank you so much, everybody. We now have a coffee break until 16.45. And could I please ask all the uh, panelists here today and the moderators who have received uh, an email regarding this to gather outside for a photo session. You walk, walk out the left doors and then to the right, please.
Hello, is it on? Är den på? Hello everyone. I think we have all had our teas and coffees now maybe and can find our way back to our places. For the last panel of today that I have the honor to moderate and my name is Sandra Kanakaris and I am the Secretary General of the Foundation Tusen Möjligheter, Thousand Opportunities. And before I present our uh, distinguished panel, I will just briefly tell you a little bit about what we do being part of the civil society here in Sweden. We are a non-profit foundation that works both national and locally and we run two different organizations. The national support hotline ungarelationer.se, youngrelationships.se, which combats boys' violence against girls and violence in young people's intimate partner relationships. And Ellen Centret, which offers support and help for children and young people who are victims of prostitution and other forms of sexual exploitation. We are members of both CAP uh, International, the Coalition for the uh, Abolition of Prostitution and Unison that you heard about earlier. And we've been working with young people subjected to prostitution and trafficking for over 12 years. And as I mentioned, our target group is uh, young people up to the age of 25. And the absolute majority of the ones that we meet are women and girls, of course. And I think it is important in this context to highlight this particular group. We often discuss small children and adult women when we talk about trafficking. Um, and that is very important too. But we also need to focus on teenage girls as a group. We know from many studies and research that the ent entering age of prostitution is around this age. And we also know that the, the demand from a man on girls and young women are very, very high. All of our work that we do is based on our experience helping and supporting young people and on the experiences they have shared with us. And at the Ellen Center, we provide help, advice and therapy through our national chat helpline and in our help and trauma center here in Stockholm. We offer support groups in person and specially trained support contacts via chat. We also do preventive work. Since there is no way that we will put an end to the demand if we do not start working with the sex buyers of tomorrow, that is the young boys of today. In our work, we see a very clear link between the work against the demand and the work to ensure support and assistance to women and girls in prostitution and trafficking. We have to do both of these things at the same time. Just focusing on one of these things is like trying to mend a leak in your house while your ceiling is broken and the rain is pouring down. There's no use. Therefore, I am very delighted to host this panel where we will talk about addressing the demand that fosters trafficking in human beings for sexual exploitation and ensuring assistance to victims. And I would like to welcome uh, my eminent panel up to the stage. First, we have Taina bien Executive Director of the Coalition Against Trafficking in, in Women. And we have Tatiana Kotliarenko, advisor on anti-trafficking issues of the OS OSAE Office for Democratic Institutions, Institutions and Human Rights, ODIR. And Sandra Norak, initiator and member of Germany Survivors of Trafficking and Exploitation Advisory Council, GSTAC. Lena Ag, director general of the Swedish Gender Equality Agency. And Olivier Caron, Special Envoy for Counterterrorism and the Fight Against Organized Crime in France. Welcome. And Anna Skarhed, former Chancellor of Justice from Sweden. And last but not least, Chissi Müller, Senior Protection Coordinator, IOM Ukraine. So as you can see, we have a big panel and we will try to have a good discussion on this. And we will start with you, Taina. You and the organizations that you have represented during the years have fought for women's and girls' rights 
during a very long time. <laughs> and also for the implementation of the legislation known as the quality model. And you have done this both in the US and globally. So what is your assessment on the current global situations and, and the needs in this field? Uh, well, first, thank you, Zandra, and thank you to the Swedish government, the Ministry of Justice, the Swedish presidency. It's just such an honor to be here. Every single day, I uh, try to implement the Swedish model around the world, uh, and I've been doing this work for 30 years, so it's such an honor to, to be here. Um, yeah, so the challenges have significantly increased. I think the high-level panel this morning was very, very thorough and brilliantly presented sort of the macro uh, challenges that we face and how complicated it is. But of course, we can't talk about uh, demand without talking about the patriarchy, right? And so the, the history of prostitution is the history of the patriarchy. And I think uh, when we think about, I think Elias was talking about new thinking, um, because the majority of uh, victims of prostitution and sex trafficking are women and girls, it's probably the reason why that governments do not really take it as seriously as they could, because with political will, we could solve the problem, if not tomorrow, then next week. Um, and so I, I think uh, when we talk about the, the history of prostitution, it's the history of male violence against women. So we know, it's only in 1993 at a UN um, meeting in Vienna that the term uh, women's rights or human rights was coined. So in our lifetime, not too long ago, and I think it's the struggle that, we, that we're all facing as civil society, as government, and, and, uh, and as others, because, as we know, before that, everything that happened to women and girls, because they were born female, were considered either religious or cultural or traditional. So whether it's female genital mutilation, sexual violence, child marriage, uh, sexual harassment, you name it, it was all considered really relegated to the, to the family or to religion or, or culture, and therefore outside of the scope of, of uh, human rights principles and also legal frameworks. So we talk about the importance of the rule of law and clearly the rule of law is, is key in also trying to change norms. Um, but what happens with the, wh what we see around the world is that in our conversations around the sex trade, and by sex trade it's this you know, global multi-billion dollar industry that includes not just street prostitution, but pornography online, uh, sugar dating, as we call it, illicit massage parlors, pornography, I mean, the entire um, plethora of commercial sexual uh, establishments. What we have done and why it's so difficult for us to understand um, the, the importance of combating prostitution is that we've created markets for that exploitation. And so in our mind, once money is involved, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, the concept of consent and agency. I, I often say that what our conversations, national, global uh, conversations around prostitution are, um, are really the conversations we had for thousands of years on domestic violence or rape or sexual harassment, right? So before laws recognized domestic violence, for instance, as crimes of power and control and male violence within a patriarchal system, it was just called life, right? It was called a bad marriage. Um, same thing with uh, all forms of sexual violence. It was always her fault. And so these are the same conversations that we have around prostitution is, whether or not she's 18, whether or not she was trafficked, whether or not she enjoys it, whether or not she feels empowered, we never talk about uh, the men, what we call the invisible men, uh, who are not invisible at all. We released a, a report on sex buyers in, in New York, where, where I am from, and we're trying to implement the, the Swedish model. Um, and it's clear that now we're in an environment at nationally and internationally talking about how to combat racism and ethnic discrimination and misogyny. And these men are very clear in exercising not only all of these abuses, 
but also um, the statements that they make, which are very, very visible online. They have hobby boards and online platforms through which they exchange information, they help each other, they rate the women. Um, there is extreme racist and ethnic fetish fetishization. Um, and in no other industry would this be allowed. And this is all uh, with the approval of the state. Um, yes. Thank you for giving us this very important context surrounding this issue that is uh, very much needed. Uh, so what do you think that we, you have already addressed it a little bit, but what do we need to do then in order to both target the demand and at the same time ensure protection for women and girls that are exploited? Um, I think there were some very interesting proposals this morning, but it's, um, I think as it was mentioned, it's, it's, um, our laws are pretty strong at an international level. They're, the challenges that we have in combating demand are cultural first and foremost. Um, they are financial in that in the last, I would say, two, three generations of adults entering the, the workforce, there have been uh, significant investments by billionaire philanthropists or very large foundations in, in funding uh, what, I, what we call the sex trade lobby, meaning individuals or organizations that support uh, the sex trade in all its forms that call for the decriminalization or legalization of the sex trade, including pimping and sex buying. Those are significant challenges. Academia, is a major challenge because uh, for the last few years they have graduated people who infiltrate legislative offices and the media and Hollywood and uh, other forms of academia who are really talking about prostitution as a form of empowerment as opposed to a form of femicide. So that's a, that's, that's a significant challenge. Uh, the other challenge is the UN system itself, uh, where we have a number of agencies that promote uh, prostitution as a form of labor. And, um, and the question is, can UN agencies actually create international law or do they have an obligation to abide by uh, member states ratified conventions? That's a question for the Secretary General's Office of Legal Affairs. And so I, I think there are two, I would say the two hopeful elements of this because we can go and talk about sort of the the the, the diet. I think as Ilias mentioned, um, I've been doing this work for 30 years. It has never been this this bad. Um, but I do think that uh, that there are two elements of hope and one is the call for medical data on the harms of prostitution. There is an absolute refusal by Certainly, in my in my country, by you know the Centers for Disease Control or National Institutes of Health or the World Health Organization, which also looks at prostitution as a form of work, uh, it's critically important to collect the data on the harms. And I'm, we're not just talking about sexually transmitted diseases or HIV/AIDS. We are talking about pervasive, lifelong psychological and physical harm that is done not just by the sex buyers to the women in prostitution, but, but also um, to, their, to their entire, um, you know, the harm by the sex trade itself, by prostitution itself. Uh, it's, it's possible. We have had uh, data collection on, on the harms of female genital mutilation, on tuberculosis, on wearing seat belts. So that is one political will. And then the second is the survivor-led movement uh, 30 years ago. Uh, there were barely survivors, and now we have a growing global abolitionist survivors. And it's also time for me to salute the Swedish women's feminist <laughs> movement, because what, what uh, governments often don't realize, but we do at the grassroots level, is none of these laws would happen without an understanding that prostitution is not an exception to male violence against women and how important it is for our governments to recognize that. And so thank you to the Swedish <laughs> feminist movement. <laughs> Thank you to you. We're, we're uh, a big movement uh, worldwide, I think. Uh, but and, and you have uh, brushed upon this now because it is important that all the official um, uh, capacities that we have, the governments and so on, take a big stand on this. But being a part of the civil society and the women's movement, what, what, what is our role 
in this issue? What, what ahead? Um, our role is to put pressure as, as, as this is what we do. We, um, I think we need to move toward proaction versus reaction. Again, the, 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 we can be, I have many sisters in this room, <laughs> so we know that on a daily basis, uh, there is an assault by the sex trade lobby uh, to, you know, to hinder our work, but I, I, there are so many examples, which I won't go into now, where the other side has poured millions and millions of dollars um, into lobbying for the support of, of the sex trade and sex buying, and we have, uh, us, we have made significant um, strides in getting the, the people to understand. I do think that, that the people on the street are with us. They, under, they understand, like, you, all you need to do is explain uh, for two minutes what prostitution is and what it does, not just to the women in it, but to their families and to their communities. And, and it's, it's very important to educate people, and I believe that they are with us. And I, I think education is key at all levels, as you had mentioned. Um, bless you. Um, I think interaction, this is a multi-level daily interaction. So it is, again, within the UN system, within your national governments, your local governments, with civil society, that unfortunately we are a shrinking ab abolitionist movement as a, as a well-funded movement, right? Because a lot of the money is going on the other side. Um, I just think you have to, I mean, our primary uh, uh, goal is to work with survivors. I think they are really our, our best, best hope. And, and with youth as well. I think if you can capture them before they go to university where, where they are brainwashed, um, I think that, that is, that's, that's our, yes. our major hope. Young people, is, they're very <laughs> important. Thank you, Taina. We will come back to you. Tatjana, I will try to, to see you there. <laughs> yes, hello. Uh, Odir was the first institution that came up with a national referral mechanism, and, uh, which is a kind of formalized support system for victims. And you recently updated this uh, in a new publication. What I, I know that it's a comprehensive publication, but, but could you say just a couple of things about the most important components in this system to make sure that victims of trafficking and prostitution get help and, and support? Thank you for that question, and I would like to also thank the Swedish EU presidency for the invitation to be here and uh, for their support, actually, to ODIR's work, especially the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council, which I'll speak to uh, in just a little while. But I have the book here with me, <laughs> and it's almost two kilos of it, and uh, there are a number of you here in this room who participated in the development of this handbook. Um, and um, it's, it's based on a wide array of expertise, but it is survivor-informed cover to cover. And that's important to note, because without that, um, we would not be able to truly understand what is needed. Um, the, the handbook is based on four pillars, identification plus protection, because we cannot identify without offering protection, individual assistance and support, criminal justice and redress, and social inclusion. It does also have some new pieces to it. For example, Taina just mentioned the issue of health. For the first time ever, there is a pretty extensive chapter in the handbook that specifically covers the health of victims and survivors of trafficking. There's also the National Referral Mechanism for Children. And what it does do, actually, is not just say the what needs to be done, but how to do it and creates real standards for implementation, as well as uh, really puts um, survivor leaders at the heart of the work. So at the top level, not just uh, as a token. Um, by creating national survivors advisory councils uh, and recommending that as a must. Um, and, um, and just ensuring that all actions are grounded in a trauma-informed, victim and survivor-centered, human rights-based, gender-sensitive, child-friendly approach throughout. 
Thank you. And, and at Odir, what would you say about the connection? How do you see the connection between targeting the demand and ensuring the assistance to victims? So I would, like, I would like to actually address it not even from the point of view of Udir to start with, but the point of view of, um, at this point in my career, thousands of survivor leaders that I have spoken with. Mm -hmm. um, there are many conversations about addressing demand, reducing demand, but what many survivors have told me, why aren't there conversations about eliminating or eradicating demand? Because how many are we willing to accept if we reduce it by, by half and the rest is okay to have? So I want to start with that particular point because we could have solutions on what to do once we detect a trafficked person. And we have really good solutions, for example, in this handbook. But when are we going to actually begin changing the systems that create trafficking to begin with? So from the point of view of OSE ODIR, I think eradication of demand is key. And the key to understanding what is actually happening and how we could actually change um, the less than 1% identification rates to um, actually 99.9% um, .9 eradication rates is by true inclusion of survivors. And by true inclusion of survivors, I don't mean just sitting on a panel. Um, and um, Sandra, I think, will agree with me on this. It's about utilizing their professional expertise and lived experience and giving them a true voice in decision-making when it comes to this particular issue. And, and you have taken steps towards doing exactly that by establishing the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Committee, ISTAC. And, and you have already uh, mentioned a little bit, but could you please elaborate a little bit more about the purpose of the ISTAC and, and why you thought that was so important? Uh, in 2021, uh, ODIR established the International Survivors of Trafficking Advisory Council and two of its uh, first uh, inaugural um, council members are here today. So Sandra to my right and, and um, Malaika sitting there as well. Um, and what, um, what we realized, honestly, is, is that this work has been unsuccessful. We have massive amounts of expertise, but we still have low identification rates. Um, demand is still not being addressed. And by bringing survivor leaders and their lived experience and their professional expertise to the table, we could actually learn on where the gaps are, how we can actually improve, and then it takes away actually also from denial of perspectives. Mm -hmm. Anyone can say, you as an expert think this, but no one can say to a survivor leader that this is just their perspective because they bring facts to the table, they bring real solutions to the table. And this is why ESTOC specifically was so important um, and it has created in many ways, the work of ESTOC members have created, created a paradigm shift. And one of the things I wanted to also um, put to the table is that shortly we will be uh, launching the code of practice in ensuring the rights of victims and survivors, which was developed by members of ESTOC, and I think that will be of huge assistance to all of your work. Yeah. Thank you very much. And it's so important that we are not just using the words of survivor inclusion, but also doing the action, of course. And thank you, Tatiana. We will get back to you also later on. And Sandra Norak, you're the initiator and member of Germany's Survivors of Trafficking and Exploitation Advisory Council, GSTAC. And you are a survivor of trafficking in Germany and have been an expert in several parliamentary investigations and hearings and debates on trafficking and prostitution. Why was it important for you? you to engage both in ISTAC and to initiate the GSTAC in Germany? Um, so first I want also to thank you um, that I'm able to be here. For me it's um, really a special moment because um, always when I you know, come to a country um, where I put my feet you know, from the plane out on the ground where I know this country has taken you know, the, the most important human rights step in human trafficking and where no um, yeah, person, nobody can be bought. You know, this is really um, something very um, important, which, which also gives survivors like me, who is living in a country where prostitution is very 
liberal and legal and where we have a lot of trafficking, um, a very good experience to know um, yeah, that it also is possible in another way. So thank you very much. And um, ISAC was very important for me and it is from now on what I have um, what I've seen the most effective, right and ethical way to include survivors of trafficking in the anti-trafficking debate. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of survivors complain, you know, or um, have problems when they are, for example, invited to a conference, um, that they are invited to tell their story, you know, tell me about your rape, tell me what you have experienced in this and this detail and then it's end, yes. you know? But that we are survivors, as Tatiana said, we have solutions to bring to the table. Um, we have answers to questions. Um, many people don't have, not because they are not also experts, but um, some answers only we can have because we were the only one who lived it and who felt it in this moment. And for example, when I speak about trauma bonding, this is um, a very common thing when it comes to human trafficking and why um, many victims are not able to leave their traffickers even if they want to leave, you know, because this is a psychological response to abuse. And when you have this, you often don't behave like a victim, you know, when you are a victim of rape or theft and somebody asks you what happened, you know, you say, I'm a victim of a crime, you know, but when you experience so much abuse, so many rapes and trafficking, it's often, you know, 10, 20 times a day for months, for weeks, for years, then it's a complex trauma and you cannot um, act like people sometimes want you to act, you know, and it's um, very, yeah, it, it's very necessary to understand also these mechanisms. And um, as Tatiana said, we can, for example, bring more um, enlightenment about these gaps, because I, for example, know how trauma bond feels. Um, also, if I was not able to identify it at the moment, when I was in it, but I know now what is the problem, I know now how people feel and I know how to break it, you know, how to, how, per, how you can help a person to break through it. And it's not just with trauma bond, it's also with a lot of other um, things that survivor can really um, help, you know, and in Istak, for example, I was two years in and no one ever asked me about my story, you know, all know about my story and they know that my um, expertise is built on my story and that my answers are built on this story, but they don't ask me, how was this rape, you know, how was this um, time with the sex buyer, you know, all these questions, they didn't ask me. And um, this is a very ethical way and the right, and for me the only right way, you know, to, um, to work with survivors and it doesn't mean, you know, I, that I never tell about my story, I do, but I decide when I want to tell about something, you know, to mark bold what I have explained, for example. And um, GSTAC is because I love the spirit of ISTAC and I have never seen this before in the anti-trafficking movement and how survivors were treated and I, wanted to, you know, to have this permanent for, for myself and also to um, be able, so in a civil society organization and um, to bring this forward, you know, this treatment of survivors and this inclusion of survivors in the anti-trafficking movement that they are able to say what they want and that they are treated equal, you know, and not just sit down and tell your story because we can have much more. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for this and I, I hope that everyone here who's planning on a conference and so can take this very, very important advice with, with them how to work at a proper way with uh, survivor inclusion and also that we all have an assignment to destroy these myths about the perfect victims and how to react and so on. Um,
And have you uh, uh, then, from your capacity, have you seen any links between a legislation that targets the demand and the assistance that is available for victims? Could you say anything about? So I come from a country, Germany, where demand is not targeted. So I can tell you what that means for the assistance of victims. And when I say the demand is not targeted, before we talked, for example, about criminalizing the knowing use yeah. um, of um, persons who take advantage of trafficking victims. And in Germany, um, the knowing use is criminalized. And we have a new legislation that also um, it is criminalized when someone acts by recklessness, so less. But as someone already said, um, we don't have much cases. And the problem is what I mean with Germany is not tackling demand is when you have a legal and liberal prostitution system. And we have, for example, advertising for prostitution on taxis, on hotels, um, posters on the streets. So a lot of advertising for prostitution and not only from the brothel owners because, um, for example, um, in Hamburg, the, the city hall, so our law is like when someone wants to work in prostitution, um, then they have to register. And in Hamburg, there is a flyer, the persons who want to go in prostitution um, is given by the city hall, so an official, you know, yeah. state authority. And on this flyer, the maybe a trafficking victim, you know, is getting in the hand because just because you are registered does not mean that you are there by free choice because the trafficker is standing outside, you know. And but on this flyer, you can read "Love Rules," <laughs> you know. And this is given by the state. So Germany is um, not only not targeting demand, but with this legal and liberal legislation, it's promoting mm. demand. Mm. And then you cannot say we are in line with Article 9.5 Palermo Protocol because we are criminalizing the knowing use or the use by recklessness, when on the other hand, you are advertising for prostitution, you know, and when um, on the streets you can buy a woman for five euro, you know. So for me, Germany is not in line with Article 9.5 and this is actually a logical thing that actually every state who acts like Germany with this legislation, who is promoting prostitution on the other side, cannot discourage or, as Tatjana said, eradicate demand because it contradicts itself. Mm -hmm. And yes, so, and, and the other problem is when you see prostitution as a job, because you ask for the assistance, yes. when you see something as a job, why you need exit services? Mm -hmm. So when I want to quit a job, when I want to quit, for example, at, you know, uh, at the supermarket, I don't need an exit service, you know, so we can see that it's not a job. But the problem is when we see it as a job, as Germany does it, because in the law it says sexual services, then you have not the real help these victims actually need. And when you ask, for example, police officers or people who are working in the field, state attorneys who have big cases, you know, um, where brothel owners are involved, and in Germany, brothels owner, brothel owners are by law businessmen, you know. And, um, but we know that most of them are, they are also in the crime because they need, you know, the, the traffickers to bring in their women. And so, yeah, the, the problem is that, um, yeah, that it's not able that in such a system you can really assist the victims because when 90%, 80% or 70%, you know, it doesn't matter more than the majority is experiencing a lot of human rights violations and human rights violations with years and often lifelong trauma, you know. You cannot assist these people when you see them and 
you know, you put the mark on them that they are a free choice prostitute because we know that the majority is not. And assisting also mean, means acknowledging that this is violence what you experience. Because when the state is telling you that this is a job and the society is telling you that this is a job and in big parts they do, it's getting better now because more and more people are going active. But if everyone is telling you this is a job and you are a very young woman or girl, I was 16 when I was recruited by my trafficker and my trafficker argumented like our state and our society, you know, this is a job. And you know, a state has also a role model and has to warn young people and not give you know, the trafficker the argument for going in this job. And so assistance means also acknowledging. Yes. And Sweden does this, so thank you. <laughs> but we, we have a long way to go, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and what, what, from your point of view, what kind of changes is needed then in the field? And, and especially what more needs to be done regarding involvement of survivors also. You have said a little bit about that, but we need obviously to do more. Yeah, so what I think is important is not just actually discouraging, but eradicating demand, but um, at least not, you know, as Germany, not promoting demand by advertising um, or such thing. And um, speak about also the, the mechanisms um, that, yeah, that survivors have to face when they are in, tra in a trafficking situation. And I also think that this is very important for law enforcement, um, police um, officers, state attorneys, judges, that they know, for example, about this trauma bonding or about um, how victims behave. The OSCE has a very good um, paper. It's uh, called Applying Gender gender sensitive approaches in combating human being. And there it also stands that it's very important for um, law enforcement to um, look at the individual perpetrator victim relationship to be able to help, to be able to help to identify, but also to be able to help to, um, you know, to catch the trafficker. Because if you absolutely don't understand how trafficking works and how um, victim-perpetrator relationships looks like, you know, and it is, it is very often when it comes to human trafficking that the victims say, I'm doing this by free choice, you know, because they are threatened, because they are afraid. And sometimes, yes, they don't have a consciousness of being a victim because they they are used to violence since they are a child, you know? And when you are used to violence since you are a child, violence, sexual abuse, then you sometimes think it is normal or that you don't deserve something else, that you don't deserve another life. And then when there is a judge, you know, who's sitting in front of you and this person who was trafficked and is, may and is maybe later in free choice prostitution because this person is absolutely broken, you know, and has no options, subjective options, you know, to go out. And then you have a judge who says, oh, you have also been there by free choice at the end, so it can't be so bad. You know, it's, it's totally damaging because they must understand what are the trauma consequences and what, what, has, what was done to this person, that this person is so broken that it is doing 10, 20 times sexual abuse by free choice. Mm. And this is also the reality we must speak about and um, the persons you know who are working in the practical area, they must know about these mechanisms to help. Thank you very much, Sandra, for this extremely important point. And we will come back to you too. Uh, Lena, we move on to you. Uh, you're the Director General of the Swedish Gender Equality Agency, and the agency has the role to coordinate the work against exploitation in prostitution and all forms of trafficking in human beings, but we will be focusing on the work against sexual exploitation. And what would you say, the role in the, the Swedish legislation, what role does it play when it comes to the work against the demand and the, the work to ensure assistance to victims of prostitution? And how are these both aspects integrated in your agency's work today? Well, thank you, Sandra. Um, well, 
let me be clear. Uh, buying sex is an act of gender-based sexual violence. That is clear. And also, Sweden's policy is clear that prostitution can never be regarded as a profession. Prostitution is exploitation. So that's sort of the bottom line here. And I think I've, we've heard it from the panel in various ways uh, during, uh, during the day. Now, uh, combating or eradicating uh, demand for prostitution and trafficking for sexual exploitation has been one of the main aims of the Swedish Sex Purchase Act since its introduction in 1999. Without demand, no prostitution. And uh, the Sex Purchase Act is clearly focusing on the demand, criminalizing the buyer of sexual acts, decriminalizing the victim of crime. So earlier evaluations uh, of the law uh, shows that it has had a deterrent effect on prospective buyers of sexual services. And although... Um, uh, street prostitution have decreased. I mean, we know also that digitalization uh, poses a, 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 a huge challenge in this, in this area. Also, uh, criminals has not sought to establish organized trafficking networks so readily uh, in Sweden. And as uh, the Minister of Just Justice pointed out this morning, uh, the law has contributed to a change of norms and attitudes in Sweden regarding prostitution and, and human trafficking. Um, International studies show that the number of men who has paid for sexual services is much lower in Sweden than in neighboring countries. Uh, studies also show that the prevalence of prostitution is higher in the countries that legalize prostitution compared to Sweden. So before the law came into existence, there were some concerns that uh, it would be uh, lead to increased vulnerability and violence against uh, those in prostitutions. H prostitution. However, uh, we know from the Nordic studies that this is not the case. On the contrary, um, more severe forms of violence is, is less common, actually. So, okay, so now to the assistance of victims. Um, the Swedish Gender Equality Agency is contributing to the improvement of protection, support and treatment of persons exposed in, prostit in prostitution through knowledge development, um, sharing of best practices and methods between stakeholders. We are also funding regional coordinators located in all uh, Swedish regions that are experts in prostitution and trafficking in, in human beings and uh, support social services and local stakeholders. We are also funding the voluntary return and reintegration program of IOM and the national support program managed by uh, the Swedish National Platform Against Human Trafficking, which is a civil society umbrella organization. Uh, last year, we uh, conducted an overview of campaigns and projects aiming at the prevention of sexual exploitation of children, prostitution and trafficking. The overview uh, included 93 interventions from different parts of the world. And the results show a lack of evidence-based interventions and almost no interventions focusing on the demand. Yeah, and, and on that note, how, what is uh, your assessment on the need for more enhanced uh, efforts to eradicate the demand then? Well, the lack of evidence is, of course, um, it's troublesome. We know we, we need to know what is effective and what works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one thing that uh, the overview shows, though, is that shaming a buyer or trying to appeal to their empathy for the victim have very little effect. However, the so-called bystander approach uh, to send the message to bystanders, mostly other men. To take a stand against violence and prostitution is an approach that has proven effective. 
And uh, the Swedish, uh, the, the agency, um, uh, is therefore developing information campaigns based on the bystander approach. For example, a campaign preventing sexual exploitation of children abroad. And this campaign is directed to Swedes on vacation abroad. Uh, encourage them to report any suspicion of sexual exploitation to the police. It's called Travel Courage and had 2 million views on the internet during Christmas holidays last year. We also see that school-based violence prevention uh, is another effective uh, tool, and uh, the agency is currently developing uh, materials directed at schools and private companies based on the bystander approach. Uh, and we're also funding uh, violence prevention initiatives and methods that uh, local authorities and civil society can apply for. Mm. And, and uh, what role would you say? You have a background in the civil society, uh, also being the, the Secretary General of Kvinna till Kvinna earlier, and, and your agency is also, as we said, coordinating the work, and we know it's important that we have a close collaboration between the civil society and the authority. What would you say about the, the role of the civil society well, in this I mean, issue? It, well, it's crucial. It's really very, very important, and we, we are cooperating closely with, with civil society and the women's movement, of course, um, and uh, so the exchange of information and the funding of the national support program and, and funding of interventions on violence prevention is something that we, uh, that we do frequently. And um, uh, since uh, Russia's aggression uh, and war against Ukraine started, this cooperation uh, has been essential. Uh, since civil society is provided rapid information directly from the ground, uh, it, it clearly improves also our and other agencies' uh, capacity to provide the refugees with, with relevant information and support needed. Mm. Thank you very much, Lena. Um, Olivier Caron, uh, you have in France had the legislation now uh, since 2016 uh, and uh, uh, it also stipulates that people in prostitution should be given an exit out of prostitution. Could you please share with us some background information on the legislation and the reasons why France <coughs> chose to adopt this legislation? Um, thank you. Well, thank you first to Sweden for hosting this event. Very happy to be able to, to contribute and to ch share views. Um, with uh, on uh, the French experience, which is of course more recent than that of of Sweden, but was informed, which is informed by similar uh, considerations. Simply the fact that uh, well, uh, prostitution is just incompatible with the dignity of the human person, and and it is danger to the welfare of the person of the individual. That's full stop. You know, it's pretty simple. So once you adopt this, well, this has been international norms so long, but you, when you bring it to this logical. To, the, to its logical development, if something is contrary to the dignity of the human person, and if it endangers the welfare of individuals, then there is no way you can uh, touch, look at this issue as some kind of uh, lesser evil to be managed, or uh, lesser evil to be managed and uh, mitigated or worked with, because you know it's a fact of life. No, before uh, a few decades ago, people thought that rape was a fact of life. No. So you no, know, the, the norms change, and so I think this is consistent with with the well, I think with, with the proper norms and the proper respect for the, the for the human dignity overall. Mm. And so, uh, so this is why the only approach that is consistent with this is abolitionist. It's abolition. It's not mitigation. It's not diminishing. It's eradication. Of course, eradication takes time, but that's, it's important to make the to make the case the clear that the objective is this: that is really to snuff out demand for for sexual services. Full stop. So basically, the law. What's important is that the law also recognizes prostitution as violence. It's violence in and by itself. Whatever the, it's uh, a, a person who is subject to prostitution is subject to violence. Whatever the, whatever the circumstances, it is considered as violence. And it is gender-based violence as the majority, the overwhelming majority of victims are women and, and, and girls. So the second, uh, the second, uh, the, the second aspect, of course, the second aspect of this is also the um, the uh, 
holding to account the clients who, by purchasing these services, fuel the prostitutional machine, so to speak, um, prostitutional system. So, of course, it's very so. This we don't have yet sufficient. The law is from 2016. Sufficient um, elements to, undo, to 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 gauge the effect on people. But I would submit well, the concept of shaming. I mean, shaming is a bit. Uh, is, a, is of course a bit uh, difficult to manage, especially it's not it's it's not really the French way of seeing things. But for many people, having a criminal record because it's a felony, so having a criminal record with a sex a sexual offence on it on your record follows you, and it's like I would submit for a number of people would not be it's not a very uh, this is not a very, uh, very, very not positive development. So I think this is the part. This has to be part of the game, also part of part of the process. Sec we also approach the issue with. Um, you mentioned the issue of exiting. So exiting is of course a key, a key important, a key part of uh, of the process of the approach for the persons who are victims of prostitution, and. Um, that's a uh, the exiting. So is uh, the exiting is organised through a dedicated assistance programmes, which uh, which involves civil society organisations and local by departments or local departments subdivision in France. You have a committee at each departmental level, which involves the justice system, the police, gendarmerie, civil society organizations, magistrates, health professionals, social workers, to, to, to devise a sort of exit package, so to speak, with employment, with access to social service, social help, so that people who have who have to get out of this are helped and have an option, and so they 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 get out of the window of vulnerability of inevitability, which is often the logic behind the uh, behind the defeatist approach against uh, against prostitution. Uh, one also important element which I've put in place is that now, uh, you know, in France there is a commission for the indemnification for the compensation of victims of crime, of trafficking, and a victim of pimping is eligible to this financial compensation, which is usually funded, uh, which is a fund which is funded by the seizures, by the um, forfeiting of criminal assets. So I see this up. And also, well, for those persons who come from abroad, uh, who, are traf who come from abroad, of course there, there is a provision where there is a automatic temporary residency permit, which basically helps persons who are victims to avoid the, tra the, 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 the trap falls of vulnerability linked to the legal status in the, in the country. So I think that's, a, that's also a, a component of the security that you have to give to persons when they are uh, trafficked from abroad. But of course, uh, traf uh, prostitution from abroad, trafficking from abroad, is an important component, but also domestic is very strong. Also, yeah. uh, even, the, even the most important, the domestic component is the uh, is the uh, most important component of the prostitutional phenomenon in France, with new forms of, uh, especially the, what we call proximity uh, prostitution, that is not networks organized networks, but small local networks in small cities and small projects around the large cities where you have very very small networks that are very difficult to penetrate because they are often organized by very young people with very young victims. Uh, online, of course, with all the, um, with all the um, anonymity that modern digital technologies and social networks afford, which is a challenge. But so that that is so this is something that complicates the work, but it's a new dimension that we have to take into account. But that doesn't change the principled approach, given the fact that you have that you that you are dealing with very young populations. Sometimes it's also more difficult to impart the the the, the gravity of the infraction of the violation of norms, and this was also this is also part of an educational process but it was basically something that is also something not uncommon in all fields of law enforcement. But in this case, given the, 
the, uh, the stakes for the person involved, this requires a great priority. And this is why we also have a specific program targeted toward the protection of the prostitution of minors, where we have a specific approach with specific mechanism, exactly which are tailored to these new kind of phenomena which evolve online and offline. Yes, very important to address both of them. And you have talked now a little bit about how the law is implemented in France. Do you already see any results of the legislation that you could share with us? Well, it's, uh, I mentioned the legislation is from 2016. It's very recent, so we, have, we start to have some... Uh, we have to start to have some, some, uh, uh, some experience with the numbers. What we can say is that the, uh, since we, since we, have, we follow statistically these issues, the persons who are, number of persons who are charged for pimping, for instance, has, has, hasn't, has been the highest, has it been for, for decades. So apparently this, you have knock-on effect mm. of the legislation on the more traditional uh, law enforcement the considerations relevant uh, to prostitution. The number of investigations uh, related to the matter has also increased a lot by 54%, which means because which reflects basically the fact the, the law, basically the fact that the law, as the law creates a new felony, yeah. a new incrimination, where we have more material to work with because you have more people involved. Also, it re re reflects the fact that the French state has also been pumping up a number of some re important resources in fighting this because when the law was passed, the, there was also, it was also included into the budget program for the uh, law enforcement services, police, justice systems, and the like. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, what, the, the, the number of convictions, not only the number of, not only the caseload, which is number of investigations, but also the conviction rates are also go going up. So that's yeah. so. It, so it's a positive. Uh, it's a positive indication that the trends. The trend is positive. But as I said, it's 2016. We're 2022. We need some more time to really have full view. But the trends we're seeing are quite are, are quite uh, heartening. I would say in terms of the in terms at least of the efficacy mm -hmm. of the response. But very important also, as, as you stress, the, the budgeting, that the resources are combined with the new legislation. That's, of course, extremely important. And since 2019, France and Sweden have been implementing a joint diplomacy against trafficking for sexual exploitation. Why is it important to highlight the equality model and the work against uh, the demand and assistance to victims on the international arena, which are kind of the point of this diplomacy? Uh, what, what we have to realize that well, this, the, the phenomenon prostitution is of course a global. It's a transnational phenomenon. You have networks that are uh, that are enabled, that are enabled and uh, facilitated by uh, external circumstances. Uh, by uh, well, of course, uh, different uh, geopolitical crises, economic crises, and uh, in fact, emphasizing the equality model, even though it's not universally accepted yet, is something that uh, is something that 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 uh, really fi fixes a, a perspective. It's not only about uh, it's not only about managing pragmatically. Uh, an issue, but it's really setting a superior norm to which, which would be the reference point. And uh, basically, if we emphasize this, uh, it means uh, those who advocate for a more pragmatic quote unquote, system will have to justify why they don't why they don't, the justification is more difficult if you have a sort of norm which would be more adopted internationally, so to speak, a reference point, not yet a norm, but a reference point, which uh, I think is something that pulls, pulls, pulls things together. So in all the international fora where we, uh, where we, uh, where this issue has been discussed, we have had joint initiatives, we had joint declaration by the French and Swedish foreign ministers, for instance, at uh, where we different events in different fora, we have always pushed this. So it's, it's a long slog, 
but it's something that's worth uh, pursuing and continue pursuing. Definitely worth continue pursuing. Thank you. And Anna Skarhed, uh, you're the former Chancellor of Justice in Sweden. And in your former role, you were appointed inquiry chair to do an evaluation of the Swedish ban to purchase sex. And you have also during many years been active in these issues. Could you please, uh, we have spoken about uh, the, the, the background and so on, but could you elaborate a little bit more on the rationale behind the Swedish legislation? Yeah, this will be then the history lesson, okay, <laughs> right? Because Sweden has had this legislation for almost, it's 25 years. We should have come further, I think, really. But when Sweden in 99, as the first country in the world, decided a law, uh, there had for many, many years in Sweden been a discussion about this. And uh, you can say that actually looking into this, it's a bit, uh, no one really knows how it came to be a law at that time. Mm -hmm. But there were women's groups and it was very clear that this was about violence. It was uh, uh, against violence against women. Uh, so um, previous measures before this had been focused on the persons uh, the vast majority, of course, women and girls who were exploited, what we at that time called the prostitutes. It all was about the prostitutes. And to criminalize the buyer at that time was really a change of perspective, targeting the demand. Today we are speaking about this as something quite natural, but at that time this was really something new. And so many times when I've been speaking about this, I say that the simple logic is which has also been said by several persons today, that if there was no demand, there would be no prostitution and there would be no trafficking. Uh, in the, uh, in when, when this was put in, in place, it was said that this was uh, something that we needed in Sweden. Fighting prostitution was of pressing social interest since this business entails serious harm both to individuals and to society. And the legislative proposal stated that it's shameful and unaccepted, and this now is 25 years ago, it's shameful and unaccepted in a gender equal society based on the principles of human rights that men, since almost all buyers are male, to claim the right to exploit others sexually. And of course, it was also emphasized at that time, but this has been more lately, and I think it should be emphasized even more, that prostitution finances serious organized crime. We've heard the figures today. Uh, this is, some say it's bigger than weapons, it's bigger than narcotics, and someone said the fact today that while you sell the weapons once, you can sell the persons many, many, many times. So this is a lucrative business. And I have for myself thought that many of those who are sort of pro-prostitution and saying that this is something we should accept, they should realize that this fosters, this uh, means that we accept grave criminality and that prostitution gives the money to make this happen. And that is a fact. Uh, well, the idea was, of course, as you said, Liana, that this should have a deterrent effect on prospective buyers to have a criminalization and that it would also reduce the interest in establishing prostitution, organized prostitution establishments in Sweden. And it's important, which has also been said, that in Sweden we are abolitionists. We want to eradicate prost prostitution. We do not want to sort of make it a little less usual. We want to eradicate it. Then I just want to make a point, because many of you use this word, and we use it also in the Swedish context. We talk about sexual services. I think that should just be taken out of the language. This, you could say, buy sex. Uh, or you could also say, of course, use other persons in, a, in an uh, inappropriate way. But to call it sexual services, I think is, ooh, I don't like that. So that is the basic. 
and language is important, yeah. as we know, that's where it starts. So it's very important how we phrase things. And, and in the inquiry uh, that you did, what effects of the legislation could you see? Lena mentioned a little bit about it, but a little bit more. And what were the main findings and are they still valid today, would you say? Yeah, of course, we had, uh, as Lena also said, but the learning, the repetition is the way of learning. So I will say it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That the prevalence of street prostitution uh, was about, it was interesting, the, the prevalence of street prostitution was about the same in the three capitals of Sweden, Denmark and Norway before Sweden uh, made this legislation or put this legislation in place. And then when we looked at this 10 years later, we could see that in Sweden, street prostitution had been halved, 50% down, while in Denmark and Norway, persons in street prostitution had increased by 100%. Uh, and our result, or we said that this should be a result of the legislation. And then you could say, is that true? Were there other com components? But it was very interesting because when Norway installed this legislation in 2009, they had exactly the same result, that prostitution went down. And we also looked at the fact that uh, internet was coming these years. I mean, there was almost no internet in 1999, but 10 years later, of course, but we could see from ads and other play that the uh, amount of prostitution uh, in well w that was sort of coming from internet was also much bigger in Denmark and Norway than it was in Sweden. So our finding was that we did reduce the the amount of prostitution, uh, but also. Um, we could say that, well, another, another thing about this was that um, the police who are the ones who know most about what is happening and who see this in the street, uh, they said that it was true as was hoped that it was less attractive to establish more extensive prostitution business in Sweden because of the legislation. It had a deterrent effect and it counteracted the establishment of organized crime linked to trafficking. And also a fact was that the police found that the legislation made it easier for the police since they could go for the buyers, they could find trafficking in an easier way, which I would say also is a, a good thing about this. But then you ask me about the situation today. Mm. Uh, and uh, well, one more point that we also looked upon the fact that some people who said before that the persons in prostitution, that they would be harmed by this legislation, by the criminalization. And we could find no evidence of this. And Lena also said that if you look at statistics from Sweden, uh, there are less, I mean, being in prostitution is lethal. Mm. It's very dangerous. But still, if you look at Sweden and compare it to Germany, for example, I mean, it's, uh, it's, a better, it's better here, although I wouldn't use that word <laughs> almost, but that's the point. Uh, well, we still have prostitution, we still have trafficking in Sweden. And uh, sometimes this is used as an argument against the legislation. They say, well, I mean, you still have this. What's the point about this legislation? And then I think you should say that this is, does not mean that the ban is not working. Mm. Or, and you could make a comparison and say, I mean, we still have murders in Sweden. We still have theft in Sweden. And no one would even think of the idea of taking away that criminalization. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting when you have this discussion that this is used as an argument here, mm -hmm. but it's not used in other, in other contexts. Definitely. But of course, uh, we must continue to work against this. And internet today is the main arena, and this has been pointed out today too. I mean, with social media and especially with young people, yes. which really is uh, a problem. Mm. And uh, 
and it's still a fact. It's very difficult to count exactly or measure the extent of prostitution. I, for myself, say that this is not so important. We have to work against it. We know it's there. We know trafficking is there. And we know, for a fact, now with Ukraine, with the well, with all this money that's going into this, that trafficking is a very, very big problem. And that is something we have to work against. Mm. And you, you said that we have still things to do, of course, yeah. in Sweden. And, and one of the things that we are doing is that you're now in charge of a new inquiry yeah. uh, that is looking into and pro hopefully present a suggestion to the government of a national exit program, both for children and adults. Could you just shortly, briefly tell us a little bit about what you're... Yeah, I can say that, that then I sit here as the Swedish, the pioneer, and now we have to learn from France. Yes. Mm. Now we have to learn from Israel. Now we have to learn from other countries where they have worked on this much more than we have still. Mm. But I'm very happy because in our report from 2010, we talked about the fact that criminalization, of course, it's, as I see it, that's a part of the, uh, of the answer but it's a very small part of the answer. The important thing is to continue with social measures and focusing on children, focusing on school, how to uh, do this, and the normative effect, which we, uh, I didn't say that before, but we found that there was a big normative effect of the legislation. Two years before we had the legislation in 1999, 70% of those who were asked said that it was a stupid idea to make this criminalized. Two years later, 70% were in favor of the criminalization. And actually right now, I wouldn't say, I don't know exact figures, but there is a normative effect about this. Just like we in Sweden use uh, the idea that today you cannot hit your children, which was okay some years ago. But today this is normative Yes. In fact, no one would say that it's okay. So we have to work in yeah. the same way with this. But what we do now is that we try to uh, figure out how we can help those who are trapped in prostitution and who are trafficked. Mm. And there are a lot of difficulties in this. Uh, in Sweden, the vast majority of those who are used, the victims, they are not Swedish. They come from other countries. They come because they are poor or they come because they are put here. And this is, as some of you have already said, I mean, we have to have means to help them. Uh, you have this legislation which says that, or the, the idea that you can stay in, in the country for some months at least to, have, to get the help. And this, I think, we have to get in place, but many other, also many other things. Mm -hmm. So we are working on this, but now we have to listen to France, we have to listen to Israel, and we have to learn how to work uh, to get better exit programs for our victims here in Sweden. We're looking forward to the, the results coming. So uh, last but not least, Chisi Müller, about then, um, you, we already heard that Sweden also funded a bit of the um, IOM in Ukraine. Uh, and from a protection perspective, would you say now being there on the ground, what are the biggest needs in Ukraine at the moment to protect women and girls from sexual exploitation and trafficking? It's a huge question, of course, but... It is. Uh, the, the biggest needs to protect women and girls from trafficking in Ukraine, I think I would take us back to what the Deputy Minister was saying this morning, because uh, obviously as an esteemed Deputy Minister, she says it best, um, the needs have grown exponentially because of Russia's aggressive war on Ukraine, and it's one that started in 2014, and then you had the full-scale in invasion that began in 2022, and how that has affected the entire population. So that's the, the macro statement that I'll just make for all of you to bear in mind. And when I think about the question and how to break down the question, because we can't, I can't talk 
as as my brain, I can't talk about 40 million people. That's too big for me. So I think about some of the latest data that is coming out as part of the response to this full-scale invasion, what the government of Ukraine is doing to, uh, in part of its counteroffensive, but also what the government of Ukraine is doing to support its people using partners from um, a wide range of UN agencies, local NGOs, and whatnot. And you can look at some of the data that it says that for the internally displaced persons, which are already several million people inside Ukraine, again, women and children, if you look at the data that is from the EU member states about the number of Ukrainian refugees who've registered for temporary protection, again, women and children, and more recently, if you look at the data that's coming out about what is it that IDPs say they need, what is it that Ukrainian refugees say that they need, and what is it that all other Ukrainians inside Ukraine say they need. They're looking for some type of, well, one piece <laughs> that goes without saying, but they're looking for some type of stability to counterbalance the socioeconomic fluctuations that are occurring. And if we think about it from an anti-trafficking perspective and we look at how recruiters manipulate situations in order to entice people to then exploit them, it's usually that promise of a job, as was said. It's, it's money. It's somehow to earn some money. And so when I look at that macro and try to break it down, it sounds very simple, but I know it's also very elusive, which is the livelihood support. It's enabling people who've been affected by the war in Ukraine to, to, to get on with what they want to get on with with their next steps. And for example, we had um, some some people, some Ukrainians who had been displaced not once but twice. So once from 2014 they were displaced and IOM assisted them as part of our protection caseload and then they got displaced again and they were particularly vulnerable to being trafficked and so that's why we were supporting them. When they got displaced again they asked for us to help support them with new equipment because they had to leave the equipment behind. And then they'll be up on their feet and they'll, they'll take it from there. So it's small initiatives like that at the individual level that I think we, particularly we, where the government is working at the macro level, we as IOM and other smaller partners can, can fill in those gaps to work at the individual level. Of course, the awareness raising is also something that must continue. Um, thanks to some of the, the people who were speaking this morning, they elevated the discussion um, at the, in the global level of what was happening about and the possibility of trafficking occurring for all the people who were on the move. And I think it's that awareness at the at the higher level as well at the, the local level, which is what many partners are doing in Ukraine, is making sure that awareness still continues. That said, of course, awareness raising on human trafficking has been happening in Ukraine for more than 20 years. It was one of the first countries that did quite a bit of work in this area and continues to do work. I would also say that um, in order to... Uh, protect women and children from being exploited, I would ask the government, and it's nice to hear again the deputy minister's comments, that they don't forget this in addition to all of their other priorities that they have as a government. Mm. That's extremely important. And and we have heard earlier today about the links that we all uh, are very aware of between ongoing sexual violence and rapes during war and trafficking. Uh, how do you see the links in Ukraine? I see the links um, in a couple of different ways. One is that, and it was even said by one of the panel members earlier today, how some victims of trafficking, and in fact, when they break down the, the profile of victims of trafficking and sexual exploitation, came from a background of abuse and violence. And so when I look at the future, I wonder if the people who are being exposed to violent incidences right now, if that then makes them more susceptible to a recruiter's tricks as they try to 
bring them into an exploitative situation. So that's one way. Another way I look at it is um, with conflict-related sexual violence, as well as uh, trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation, as was said, they're forms of GBV, gender-based violence. And as a result, we should be treating them as also was said, I feel very duplicative right now, sorry. Repetition <laughs> as, is good, that's what I said. Yes. Uh, as also was said, we need to treat it with a survivor-centered approach, but I think it's more than that. And there is um, a desire in uh, Ukraine in particular to give attention to one form of GBV over another form. And that shouldn't be the case. We should provide assistance in a way that is dignified and respectful and confidential based on what that person prefers. And if that person prefers not to have their situation officially recorded with the government, they should have that choice. And this is where the pressures can come into play between not only the different kinds of uh, GBV forms, so trafficking or conflict-related sexual violence, but also other incidences. So you, you are all also often involved in national referral mechanisms, and so far we have seen rather few cases, identified cases from Ukraine. Uh, are we failing to see this and identify this sexual exploitation? And if so, are we waiting on it? Is it to come uh, in the near future? In preparation for this com conference, I was looking at some of IOM's data from the last 20 years and how IOM's caseload in Ukraine of victims of trafficking from 2000 to 2010, give or take a few years, um, most of our cases were Ukrainian women who had been sexually exploited abroad. So Poland and the Russian Federation. And then in 2010, I think when, when a lot of the understanding changed that it could also be forced labor, our caseload shifted. And so these days, in fact, our cases are overwhelmingly forced labor cases. They are still about half and half women and half and half men, so 50-50, thereabouts. Um, but when it comes to what are we looking for now and and what can we remember to do? And then what are the barriers to understanding who's exploited and why? I think that um, some of those old, but yet very real barriers are there. The stigma, the self-blame, not understanding that the individual was a victim of a crime. And to disclose that information, which is incredibly personal, um, is embarrassing and mortifying. And again, why should they have to share their information? Whereas with these, and that's for some of the, the sexual exploitation cases, whereas with the forced labor cases, for some reason, I don't know why, but for some reason, the, um, the victims of trafficking for forced labor are disclosing more, and maybe it goes back to their fighting for their wages, and it's easier for them to argue for their wages, and it's also easier for government entities and partners to also help with that. And I think then looking into the, the next several months, where we know those socioeconomic factors that I spoke about earlier are continuing to fluctuate, that we recently, in the last few weeks, and this is where we're bracing ourselves, have also seen the number of cases go up. And I think that connects to how trafficking manifests and it takes a bit of time. The question is the sexual exploitation. And that's, that's where I think we all need to draw attention to and continue to do work about it. Yes, we all need to step up our game, definitely. And unfortunately, you have been said so many good and interesting things, so we won't have time to do another round. Uh, but I think that you all have gotten uh, extremely valuable information and tools from uh, our panelists on how to keep on working to eliminate this extreme form of men's violence against women that trafficking and prostitution is. So a big thank you to the panelists uh, and <laughs> now it is up to us all to take this work further. Thank you very much.
Yes. Thank you so much all for this interesting discussions today. Now we're going to have a short break and continue again at seven, where we're going to have a drink and a little bit entertainment from Stråk Kapellet, who's going to play some live music. So the drink is where you had your coffee is just around here in the corner. So go outside to the right, the way you find the drink. At 7.30, we start the dinner and the dinner is just beside where you had your coffee. So it's in this building, not the hotel. So a drink at seven and you can listen to some music from Stråkapellet. Thank you so much.